Good afternoon to Safari Live. It is Sam Chevalier as presenter and Viem behind camera. We have just come down to Juma watering hole to come and see this quite a large group or a breeding herd of elephants that have just come and drank. They literally walked right past us. If you were looking on the on the dam cam, you would have seen how close some of them were getting to our vehicle. And now they're moving off down Twin Dams Road off into the distance. So it's been a fantastic morning already. We had an exceptional sighting of hyenas. I woke up this morning and we saw all sorts of stuff from the gymnogene. And it's all just been quite exciting really. And we just heard all these elephants that were down here by the dam. We thought why not start with a nice big group breeding herd of elephants and see what direction they might be heading in. But it's not only this group here. There's another elephant that's still down there by the watering hole. Let's have a look before we go. There's not just elephants down here, but there's also some buffaloes that are sitting down by the watering hole. So if you actually were watching on the dam cam, you would have seen that the one female got so close to us that she started almost brushing our car with that little piece of that stick there, as if she wanted to clean us. I don't think Wendy's that dirty, but it was quite... Well, Wendy's our car, by the way, if anyone is wondering who Wendy is. And I think she was really curious because I was wearing my, my hat, my birthday hat, and she just came, she just came right, us, right up to us and, and started looking at us quite interestingly. So I don't think I'm going to wear that hat right now. Maybe when, maybe when a bit later when there's no big female elephants that want to look at us differently. So here are the the big buffalo bulls that are sitting down by the watering hole. And it's quite interesting that elephant is now moving off. There's the dam cam. So we have one that looks like a male. So the male's going in a complete opposite direction and he's not going slowly either. He's, he's really missioning off into the distance there. He's not following the others, which is quite interesting because they were all moving together as one big family group and now it looks like it might be a lone bull that just joined them down by the watering hole and saw that they were drinking and just came to see some of the females. But there is a strong, well, quite a loud sound of the red-billed oxpecker that would be sitting here with the buffalo because oh, there's one right there on the furthest buffalo in the distance here. You'll just see the silhouette of a red-billed oxpecker. The red-billed oxpeckers will give us an indication that there are big animals out here. There's actually four on this one over here. Before we go back down to those elephants, let's quickly go see if there's a yellow-billed oxpecker. That would be such a great thing to see on our birth, on my birthday. I've only ever seen one of them. There goes that big. Look how now you can really see the contrast of how big that bull is while he's inside that watering hole there. Oh, well, not the watering hole, down the drainage line. He, I think he's gonna go and browse on that tree that he's going towards. So I'm just gonna turn around. We're gonna leave that bull over there, and we're gonna go and follow. Oh, here comes a big buffalo towards the watering hole. Maybe he's coming to join his brothers sitting down. Oh, a very active afternoon already. And there's a female one just down. You know, there's quite a lot of activity out here. So there's another, looks like a female buffalo that's coming up here. You often normally just find the females. Was either a female or a youngster? This is quite interesting. Let's watch the interaction between this buffalo coming up here with all the ox pickers on its back and the other one. So look, we can actually look at the features of this buffalo that's just in front of us and then the one that she, oh, it looks like she's moving towards. She looks quite cautious as she walks in, towards this male here. Interesting little bit of interaction between the two.
two buffaloes. She looks like she's following him. And he's quite an old bull. You can tell that he's quite an old bull just purely because of not only the size of him, but you can see that his skin has been worn down quite some bit. And that's often what happens with these old bulls. They, they lose a lot of the hair on top of their backs there. And that's why they like to be down in these cold, cooler areas in the watering holes to cover up from the sun and collect some mud on top of their backs. So we we'll probably find that this big buffalo will come and walk into this watering hole now. Here he is, he's right there. And that female, there's another buffalo that's walking just up here. So we've got two of the big five that are just walking around drinking the buffalo and the elephant. So if we're lucky, we're going to see them drink here, and we'll be even luckier if we see them jump into this water and have a nice afternoon bath. Or cool down, rather. Bath would be hot. I don't think they would be very comfortable to jump into a warm pool right now. So let's just have a look at those ox peckers on top of this buffalo. I can't see any yellow billed ones there. I can see some juvenile ones. Looks like the ox is also jumping to get some, some water, as you can see there. There we go. There's two of them are now drinking from the watering hole. So not only is the buffaloes drinking at the watering hole, but so are the ox pickers. Everything needs water out in the bush, and we're coming to that season, which is the driest season, the winter season. So. June, July, August is going to be some dry months, and this water may very well dry up over those months. Here you can see this one, actually. If we go to the one drinking, you can really see it drinking the water. There we go. So very different to that of elephants that drink at the watering hole, which you would have seen on the dam cam not, not just a few minutes ago. See him drinking there. Let's just go and quickly have a look at that other elephant. That other elephant is still down there by that big tree. So we're still in sight of that elephant. And we are in sight of all these buffaloes that are drinking by the watering hole. And it's been reported those lions that we were following up on this morning went off towards, I think it was Chitwa Chitwa, because the Birmingham boys are on Chitwa. They're all four of the Birmingham boys are on a kill at Chitwa Chitwa. So some of the females have gone there to join them with that. So hopefully, I mean, later on in the drive towards the end, we'll see if we can, we can find them crossing over into our, into our area, which will be exciting to see those Birmingham boys. Maybe they'll get some roars. Lynn, I was wondering that same question, if this is a buff calf here. And I think it is a buff calf. You can see it there. Because it is a lot smaller than them. And it's really, really interesting to see this, this, this buffalo here with these ones. Because what you'll see is there's two really big old boys here. It's almost like the young son and the dad drinking at the watering hole together, which is quite nice to see. But if you look here, these are very, very old ones to the right here as well. So we've got we've got a few buffalo that are lurking around here. One, two, three there. So you can quite quite easily see the difference between the young buffalo and these other ones. Mm. Debbie's wondering if it might have lost the herd. It's a good question, Debbie. You know, I've never actually seen this before where there's a, a much younger looking buffalo with some older ones. But have a look at the ox picker that's bathing. They're swimming in this water here. It's quite cool. See how useful, how important the water is out here, not only for drinking, but for cleansing and cleaning themselves. Very cool to see them doing this. So that significant bird call that you can hear while I'm talking is the sound of the red-billed oxpecker. Quite a, quite a, quite a strong sound. So when you're walking in the bush, 
always pay attention to that sound because that will often tell you that there is a big buffalo that could be around the corner. There we go. This is what we wanted to see. So some of the viewers are asking if that is a female buffalo, and that's what I initially thought. I initially thought that it was a female buffalo. And it looks like it because I cannot see, now that I can see it from a distance here, I cannot see the genitalia that would tell me that it's a male. So I would think that it is a female. But it's a young female. It wouldn't be an old female. But it's, it's quite interesting to see how she's following this larger male here. Interesting behavior to see this. So I haven't lost sight of that big group of elephants that were here not so long ago. There's, there's two that are still deep in the thicket there. Oh, there's actually another two that have... So the big bull that was down there has now gone into the thicket. And there's another one with a younger one that are coming to the watering hole to have something to drink. So we came here at the right time to see the animals coming and drinking at the watering hole. Yeah, they come and they can, I think, I feel like they can almost smell the water, I think. They get it's so cool to watch how elephants get excited to get to the watering holes. Look at them, they're both lifting their trunks. That's very, very interesting. I wonder if they, what would they be trying to smell? Maybe they're trying to smell not only, I think they could be trying to smell the other elephants that were in this area, potentially. I mean, Animals have a much different kind of sense than we have. Their smell is a lot stronger. Some of their eyesights are not as good though. So you'll find with some, some animals the eyesight is not as good, but their smell is incredibly good. It can help them pick up on all the different things that are happening around them. And the smell can make the difference between life and death out here in the bush. That smell of a predator that's stalking Stalking you in the bush can make all the difference to your survival. So this is going to be a fantastic sighting of these elephants hopefully coming to get something to drink. Yeah, they come. So this one looks like a female over here. And the youngster just behind her. Watch the way in which these elephants drink. This is so cool. So much different to the buffalo, of course. They just put their trunk into the water there and they suck up their straw. And that's the way they then lift it into their, into their mouth and drink the water. So we're going to be having a school drive at around 3.30, and that'll go for 45 minutes. I'm looking forward to bringing some of the kids onto our drive, teaching them some of the interesting facts of the wilderness. And they're going to be interested in learning about animal characteristics. So please send in your questions before 3.30. We've still got 15 minutes. If you have any questions, please send through questions at wildearth.tv. That'll be to our email address. but you're also welcome to send all your questions during the school drive. We can still collect them, and as soon as the school drive will be finished, we'll answer all of them that you've sent. Well, we'll do our best to answer all of them. But this is very cool to see the elephants drinking here. I must say, it's a great way to spend your birthday. Coming down, watching elephants drink. That buffalo is starting to get closer into the water now as well. I've got two elephants drinking and a buffalo looking at the elephants quite cautiously, trying to decide whether it should go deeper. I think it should. We'll get to watch it. Bath. Look at how the youngster has, is only a couple years old. It's really developed the ability to now use that dexterous trunk of it. 
So they put their trunk into that water, suck it up, and lift up their heads and drink it. We had such a special sighting of, of young elephants playing in the water. It's really, really cool to see how they learn. Yes, yeah, so there we go. This is such a so much going on at this watering hole. You've got birds drinking and washing themselves, buffalo coming in closer, two elephants that have been drinking. Tony's asking, do animals need salt? Tony, that's an interesting question. I'm sure they do. I've never read a study around the the need for, for animals to get salt. But what I have read is that some animals need needs other sort of min, sorts of minerals which they get from soil. So it's called geophagia. And what they do is they actually eat the soil and they collect some of the minerals from that soil that they need in their body, which is fascinating. And I'm sure maybe salt could be a part of that, those elements that need to be digested. I haven't seen Actually, I have seen an elephant once lift up some, some dirt and put it in its mouth. I wasn't sure why it was doing that. That could very well be why. But the wind has just picked up. All of a sudden, the winds have picked up. And there's quite a few clouds in the sky this afternoon. We didn't get much rain the other day. But that's OK, at least. At least there is some water in the watering holes. See them drinking here. So there's been quite a few elephants down by the watering hole if you've just joined us now. This is the second group of elephants that have just come down. And there's quite a few buffalo. So in the distance there's another buffalo walking in towards us and that female is still here with us, a female buffalo. Just to the right of us, yeah, here she is. There she is, so she's still with us. Interesting dynamic here. This buffalo that's about to walk past us though, have a look at all the ox pickers on its back. You can you get a closer look at them, you can actually see how they collect some of the ticks. There they are, fantastic. If you want to do, have a screenshot, you can take a picture of these four red-billed oxpeckers that will be pulling out the ticks within this buffalo here. And you can see they're, all, they're shaking off all the water after they bath. So these are all the red-billed oxpeckers that you can see. Interestingly, the reason why, well, it looks like the oxpeckers, they were cleaning, cleaning each other as well. Let's go back to those elephants so quickly. Let's see how these ellies are doing. There's so much going on here, from buffaloes to red bull oxpeckers. Mm. It's like one big pool party for my birthday. <laughs> All sorts happening down at Juma Dam. The youngsters still, I think the youngsters had a good fill of water, but is now enjoying just playing with the water there. Very cool to watch this. Just blowing some bubbles in the water. I'd be interested to see which di or in what direction these elephants now go. I think they might follow that male that went off into the distance there. You don't often find a female and a youngster walking on their own together around. So I wonder where they're they greater. Well, this, there we go. Another one's getting in here now. I was just wondering where the greater group is, breeding herd of elephants that they were with earlier. Maybe they're still coming. We could still be, we could be seeing the beginning of a breeding herd coming to the watering hole. So 
looks like the females changed positions of the watering hole to see. Just put her trunk into a new part of the water. Have a look there in the distance. There's a giraffe that's also here. Just to our left, we've got a giraffe that's just come into the scene. I can just see a giraffe in the distance there to the left. That's picking at the tree. We'll come back to the left and now. I just want to show you that giraffe that's there. There we go. So I just wanted to show you the giraffe. Hopefully that giraffe is going to come through and drink some water as well. So this really is a pool party that's happening here. But while we wait for the giraffe to come back towards us and hopefully get something to drink, let's watch this elephant that's now starting to throw water all over itself. That was so cool. Wow, there is quite a lot going on here. There's buffalo to the right of us, elephants to the left. A young female calf. Well, no, a young... Yeah, a young... I'm not sure if that's a female calf elephant there. I can't tell. It's really, really difficult to tell the sex of a young elephant. So we're going to sit here and just potentially see what else might be coming to this pool party this afternoon. With that, let's go and see how Brent is doing. He's just going out into the bush and exploring Juma. Welcome to Safari Live. Sorry about the late start for Dangerous Dave and myself, Brent Leo Smith. Uh, we had a little bit of tech difficulties. Fortunately, our tech team was all over it and it seems to be sorted. So exciting sunset safari. Let's get out, see what we can find. And remember, we, if you want to know anything about the bush, we're here at your disposable. Pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And we do have a school drive coming up, but keep sending those questions and the ladies in final control will keep them for after the school drive. So let's go see what we can find. So this morning was quite a trying morning when it came uh, to the big cats. We tracked five cats off our traverse area. But I am the eternal optimist and I'm hoping at least one or possibly a different cat might have come back. So I did hear there were some leopard tracks up around Sydney's Dam early this morning and I'm going to go ahead into the area to the sea. So we are back at the watering hole still. We're just having some problems with Signal and Brent, but those two elephants that were here now have just gone down into the drainage line there and is now heading to the other side. So we are leaving, or the elephants are leaving us now. They'll potentially go off and browse and graze in the direction of where that other big bull elephant was just now. But hopefully that giraffe We'll come down to the watering hole a little bit later. It's so cool to watch the young elephant following its mother bear. Let's watch it move off into the distance. The most incorrect is that calf's got a stumpy tail. Yeah, it does have a stumpy tail. Have a look at that, that well notice there, Vian. There's, on the back of that, elephant on the back there's a stumpy tail looks like it's been chopped chopped in half there that tail of that young elephant interesting I wonder what would have happened to that so there, there go those elephants off into the distance so we're here now faced with a number of buffaloes that are just looking at us acting like roadblocks out here. Ooh, interesting. One just got a little fright. There's quite a few ox on top of this 
buffalo here, but look at the size of those horns of this buffalo. So I think he's going to go and find somewhere to lie down. Brian in Toronto would like to know, do territorial breeding herds of elephants ever fight in disputes? It's a good question, Brian. Um, we, we were sitting with a breeding herd of elephants at, at Biffles Hook Dam just not so long ago, just a couple days, and all of a sudden another group of elephants came down to that watering hole, and there was a little bit of a, a kind of a little bit of conflict between what looked like the two matriarchs of those those breeding herds of elephants. Um, I've read in books that like that there have been there can be disputes between the two breeding between breeding herds, specifically when conditions are really really bad or or there is drought conditions where it's really dry and there's not much access to water. So that's that's when elephants will become kind of aggressive to each other when situations are starting to get a little bit more difficult out here. But elephants more have home ranges rather than territories. So it wouldn't be over a ter like a territorial over a watering hole. It would, would more mean just the access to the water itself. But this is quite an interesting display between these buffaloes here. They're really walking around each other making quite a noise. Yeah, it looks like they're moving, moving around doing some sort of Spanish dance between these two buffaloes. Let's see if they continue to do it. It looks like the other one's just walking off now. Today we've seen some fascinating behavior between animals. This morning we were sitting with two impalas that were kind of bashing each other and they were walking one Impala was walking towards other ones. Quickly have a look at this buffalo though before I talk about that. Have a look at how the buffalo is rubbing its boss. It's called the boss against the that tree over there, which is a bush willow. It looks from this to either a, I, think, I can't see it could be a guari or a bush willow, but it's wow, listen to that. It's rubbing that boss against the tree. There seems to be a little bit of a dispute between these buffalo. I think we could be in, we could be in for a little bit of not just a Spanish dance, but a little bit of a little fight between these two buffalo. It seems like they're almost testing each other's size, which is quite interesting. They're quite old boys, as you can see. Both of them are quite old, and the reason I say you can see that is because there is quite a loss of what looks like fur on top of their backs there. And they're of course not part of the big breeding herds. So when they get old like this, they become, or well, they just, it's harder for them to keep up with the breeding herds. So they come down to the thicker water, watering areas to eat on the nice rich green grasses and to drink the water. So as I said, we were gonna be with a school this afternoon. It is Glenwood Elementary and Mr. Travato who will be joining us. Welcome to Safari Live Kids. I hope that you have such a fascinating time. If you have any, any questions at all, please send an email, email at questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag Safari Live. Any questions, whether it's elephants or buffalo or whatever we might have here. Let's start off with some buffalo. We've got a buffalo here. That's not rubbing its face against this tree. You can really hear how this buffalo is rubbing itself against this tree. Well, he was, but there's quite a little, quite a bit of mud on top of that boss there. Look at that, so that would have, that buffalo would have gone down to the watering hole, which is close to us here, rubbed its boss in the water, and now has come towards 
the trees and grazing. Now we can quite clearly see as it walks next to us here, the loss of hair on the back of its back. You can see that there's a juvenile buffalo, um, oxpecker, sorry. Very, very interesting, but there's even more interesting displays happening around us. The buffalo, just in the distance there, is rubbing its boss against that tree there. Wow, this is fascinating to watch. This. These buffaloes are providing us a lot of entertainment. Here's, this, here's what looks like a female buffalo that's walking around within these group of males. I think she's feeling quite intimidated with all these males around her, but let's go and have a look at this buffalo in the distance there that is really rubbing its boss against that tree. So sometimes they get, they form, they get lots of parasites in that boss and they use that tree to rub, rub against and to try and get the parasites out. But we have got a roadblock, as you can see in front of us, so we can't quite get past. We're gonna wait for it to move through and then we'll get there. Actually, let's just go around it. We can go around him. <laughs> Kaylee would like to know, how do the buffaloes not get hurt when they're rubbing themselves against this tree? Well, Kaylee, when they rub against the tree there, you know, their bosses aren't like skin. It's very, very hard keratin, which is part of, part of the, like your nails, almost like your nails but thicker, thicker versions that have grown into these bosses. And when they rub it, they're trying to get rid of the things, the parasites inside there. So they don't get hurt doing it. It's, it's a very, very hard substance. Let's have a look at them here. So they're standing in opposite directions of each other. That we can just see an elephant in the, in the future, in, in the distance there. Kenzie would like to know, do buffalo make noises? Yes, they do make noises. We just heard them grunting at each other just now. So hopefully if we're lucky, maybe while we sit here, we might hear some buffaloes making a noise. Here we go, look at, look at it. Carmen would like to know how big buffalo get. Carmen, think of your cows back home. They're quite big, but may just maybe put another meter above them, or they're just much bigger cows, basically. Buffalo, so just a, just bigger cows that are out here on the African bush that have really, really big bosses, which are called horns, Kaylee. So they're almost like big cows, and those big cows are now walking off into the distance there. And I think uh, we should go and have a look at that elephant while that elephant is quite close to the road. And it's been fascinating sitting with these buffaloes and, and learning a little bit more about, about them, especially having a female, which I'll quickly show you before we go off to the elephant, the female, the difference between the female and the male buffalo. Have a look at the size of the boss on the one on the right to the one on the left. There we go. So that's a female and a male buffalo, and they're actually walking straight towards us, which is quite nice. See, they're quite interested in what we are. Ooh, whoa! Good afternoon, mobile station. Tristan, I wanted to keep silent there because you could really hear the sound of those bosses as they hit each other. Luckily, we didn't leave these buffalo. Let's see what they might do, Tristan. So, what they were doing there was hitting each other with the bosses. It's the female that just came. It's coming close to this male here. So, Tristan, you were saying, what is the most dangerous animal that you've encountered on foot or anything out here in the bush? These are them. The buffalo are the most dangerous especially when you're out in the bush. I once had an encounter with one of these really, really big buffaloes when I was walking on my own at, a, at where I trained, and the buffalo just started to follow me. And because they're really, really old, they don't run away when they see a predator. Well, 
most of the time, generally, they don't run away because it's easier for them to just charge and fight rather than trying to get away because they know that they can't because they're quite old. So these, what we are looking at now, when you're in the bush and you're walking, this is what you must be most frightened of and most aware of. That was such a fascinating display between the two buffaloes there. We are so lucky to have seen that so close to us, buffaloes coming and hitting each other. Wasn't that incredible? And you can imagine that's a couple tons, well, one or two tons running at each other at full force, smacking each other in the head. What's interesting is this female is following this male wherever it goes. Wow. Wasn't that incredible, guys? We got to see buffaloes up close fighting with each other. That really doesn't happen often. So let's go and have a look at that elephant that's in the distance there. Aiden would like to know, how do we keep the animals from becoming extinct? Aiden, it's, uh, it's very difficult, you know, with sometimes we have to create land for conservation. So we need to create land where we, we don't populate and we don't use agriculture and we don't have human urban areas so we can allow some of the animals to live freely. That's why we have parts of South Africa that are open to Mozambique, which was another country next to us, and, and Zimbabwe, that allows for other animals such as the elephant and the buffaloes and the wildebeest to be able to walk through the different countries. So that is how we, we just basically try and create habitat. Habitat, uh, habitat means home. He has an elephant right in front of us here. Yeah? Awesome, have a look at this elephant. I'm not gonna go too close just to see what the behavior of this elephant might be. You can see that he is starting to feed on the tree here. Where well, he was about to start feeding on the tree. It's always very important before viewing an animal just to see what its behavior might be like. Isabella would like to know what is the most rare animal I've ever seen in the bush. Well, Isabella, I've, I've seen a honey badger. I don't know if you know what a honey badger is. It loves to eat honey. That's where it gets its name from. It follows a bird called a honey guide to the different parts of the bush to eat some honey. It's called, and it's a really incredible, really, really incredible animal to see. So that's the, the best, most rare bird I've ever seen. So there's this elephant just in there. So we're going to sit with this elephant and hopefully this elephant will come back out. But let's go through to Brent, see how Brent is doing. I think he's standing on something quite large. Three, two, one. You're alive, you're alive. Hello to Glenwood Elementary. Uh, my name is Brent. I've got Dave on camera and we out on the African bush on foot. So a big welcome to Mr. Travata's class. And I know today's theme is animal characteristics. Now, this is quite a characteristic pose for certain animals out in the bush. I'm sitting on top of a termite mound, and lots of different animals use termite mounds. And quite often we'll notice they'll sneak up to the termite mound like this, and they'll sort of try to keep their head parallel with the termite mound and look around, see what they can see. And this is a really, really important thing if you're a big cat. If I was a leopard, or a cheetah, I'd approach the termite mound, come up here, look around, see if there were some impala or other animals, which they're not right now, and uh, see if I could find something to eat. But it's really nice to be able to take you guys on a walk, because normally we're in the cars. But the very cool thing about being on the walk is we can see some other animals that we're not going to be able to see so closely on the car. Now, Jaden's asking about that termite mound. And he's saying, do snakes live in it? Well, this particular one, I can't see any snake tracks, but there is a scorpion's house. So there's a scorpion that's been living in this termite mound, and you can see by the shape of its hole. So scorpions are not round, they're sort of oblong. So you can see just by the shape of that hole that that's a scorpion's house. But snakes do live in termite mounds, and we'll see if we can find some snake tracks. There were some around earlier today. 
So let's go have a look what else is around. So Jaden's actually asking a very interesting question. How big can a snake open its mouth? Now Jaden, that completely depends on the type of snake. Certain snake species are able to dislocate their jaw, so they'll be able to make it really wide. Like an African rock python, which is the biggest snake we get here, and it can eat a whole impala, and it can make its mouth very, very wide by dislocating its jaw. So we're going to try to see if we can find some snake tracks to show you, and on a nice sandy road like this, there's a good chance we should see some tracks. But you've got to be very careful when you're walking in the bush. I'm using my ears, my eyes, and I'm looking everywhere. Well, Tamir is wondering about what type of qualifications we need to get our jobs. Well, generally some form of bush qualification is necessary. I myself am very lucky I've grown up in the bush, so it's there are sort of ranger schools you can go to to learn how to be a safari guide, but at the end of the day, there's no substitute for experience and time spent in the bush. Okay, so we're looking carefully for tracks here. So far, only car tracks. So Rihanna is wondering what animals are common around this area. Well, Rihanna, Impala, which I'm hoping we'll see, and we can try pretend to be a leopard or a lion and see if we can stalk the Impala. Uh, but uh, buffalo, elephant, lion, leopard, uh, wildebeest, zebra are all relatively common in this area. Now, since we're on a walk and the cars stay on the road, I think it's enough of this road nonsense, and let's go off into the bush. Oh, look at this, guys. So we found a giraffe. Okay, if you look straight through there, I'm gonna point with my stick. And you got him there. So what we're gonna do is a giraffe behave quite characteristically when approached by certain things. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pretend that we're a lion and we're really hungry. And we're gonna see how close we can sneak to this giraffe. So if you're thinking about being a lion, that giraffe hasn't seen us yet. And We've got the wind in our favor. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna sneak like a lion now. So we've gotta get low. We're gonna go and we're gonna try to keep behind all the little bushes. So I'm gonna start talking a bit softer. And if we're lucky, sometimes giraffe, because they're so tall, they spot things from far away. And if we sit down, he might walk up to have a closer look at us. Oops, there goes my radio. Animals are always more scared of you when you're walking than when you're in a car. Now, that's because people, like lions, are a predator. So they have an instinctive response to us. Oh dear, have we been spotted? Oh no, we've been spotted. If we were a lion, we'd be going hungry tonight because our stalk wasn't that good. There we go. You can see we've been spotted. They're moving off a little bit, but because they've seen us, they're not so scared or not so worried about us. So we're gonna try another little trick uh, that if you spend a lot of time in the bush, you learn. It's called non-predatory behavior. So we've been behaving like a predator, and that's made the giraffe move a little bit away. So now we're gonna behave like a predator who's not interested in hunting. So we're gonna stand up nice and tall and walk and we're gonna try to walk to a termite mound down there, and then we're gonna sit down and see if the giraffe come closer to have a look at us. Doesn't look like my trick's working though. Sorry, Dad, just come this way. You're gonna knock your aerial. Um, so Emma's wondering, do you different animal species fight with each other. Yes, they do, Emma. Uh, specifically, since we've been talking quite a lot about predators. So lions will fight with hyenas and leopards, and hyenas will fight with leopards. All the predators will fight amongst each other. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is competition, or well, the main reason is competition, to try to remove any other predator from the area that might steal its food, or it perceives to be stealing its food. 
So there we go. Now that we're pretending not to hunt the giraffe anymore. Oh, no, there they go. They're taking off, unfortunately. So it's a very good example about why you can get close to an animal in a car and much closer than you can on foot. So a man, like a lion, like a leopard, is a predator. And the animals know that because man originated in Africa and has been hunting these animals for hundreds of thousands of years. And they have an instinctive response and that's why they've run away. But the big things have moved off. So now we're going to go see if we can find some of those small things. So Rihanna is wondering, how tall is a giraffe? Now, Rihanna, I'm six foot three, and a really tall giraffe can get to about 18 foot. So even taller than I can hold my stick up. So really, really tall, and they can be very, very heavy. So they can be about, if I remember correctly now, about 9,000 pounds. Uh, so very, very big, heavy animal. Now, here we have one of the giraffe's favorite foods. It's called an acacia tree, and this particular one is called a red thorn. Now, very small little leaves, and can you believe a giraffe will munch through these monster thorns? Now, look how sharp this thorn is. It is incredible. Now, a giraffe's, the inside of a giraffe's mouth is like an old tough leather boot so it can just break i couldn't even break that with my finger without having an owie but a giraffe will be able to sit here and eat and they've got a tongue that is over 14 inches long and it'll wrap around and strip all these leaves off and uh, one of the benefits of having such a tall body and a long neck is a giraffe can get to all the leaves up there that the other animals can't get to so while we continue on see what else we can find for you guys let's go back to Sam who's with another giraffe yeah luck when I can see it so here we are with another giraffe and we were just talking about with Brent what they eat so you can see this giraffe is now walked walking down towards the drainage line and is eating part of the tree up there so this is what you call a browsing animal you can see its tongue wrapping around the, the branch there. Amir would like to know what other types of plants will a giraffe eat? Well, this male giraffe over here looks like it's eating a... Looks like it's eating a combretum bush, which is a type of bush willow bush. So it likes to eat bush willows, it'll eat the acacias, which are the thorny ones, which I'll show you a bit later. It'll eat a bushveld gardenia. Uh, it'll eat all sorts of different other bushes. Some of them they won't. I'll show you the ones that they won't eat. But they really, really like that one that, that Brent was talking about, the acacia nigrescence, which is the knobthorn tree. But here you can see it looks like it's eating on a... Let me just get my binoculars out and I can tell you exactly what tree. Quite, quite interesting, it looks like it's eating on a Tamboti tree there. And we often find the Tamboti tree down by the thickets, but it's not an often, uh, often a tree that, the, that some of the animals like to eat because it's got a lot of tannins in it. And so the tree has adapted to not being eaten by animals. Isn't that interesting? It's adapted means that it's stopped other animals from eating it. Amir would like to know what other things might a giraffe eat other than plants. Well, Amir, a giraffe might go down and find a bone, an old bone that might be lying on the floor. And it'll go down and pick up that bone and eat it. And what it gets from that bone is, is well, it will chew on it rather than eat it. It will chew on the bone. And much like you drink your milk in the mornings to get your calcium C with your breakfast, a giraffe will chew on a bone to collect some calcium C from that bone. So that's quite fascinating. So they eat plants and they sometimes eat bones. 
Kenzie would like to know, are giraffes going extinct? Kenzie, at the moment our populations of giraffe are doing okay. They can be seen all the way down in southern Africa towards the upper regions of Africa. So we do have quite a few giraffe left, so we should be fine for now. But we do need to still think about how we're going to conserve and look after the giraffes within our human environments in the future. It's something that if you want to become an ecologist or learn more about nature, we can learn, we start to learn about how do we live and look after animals in these environments. So we are doing okay with giraffe populations at the moment. So we should be good. And this is a male giraffe that you can see here. We can tell that it is a male purely by looking at the ossicones which are on top of the head. The ossicones are those two knobbly things that are coming out of the top of the head there. And if there's no fur on, on that, if you can't see any fluffy fur on top, that means it is a male. And also the female ones are quite a lot more narrow, which means they push together a bit more, or push out, sorry. They push out. So these, this is a male. And the males are also quite a lot larger. And the reason why there's no fur on top of these giraffes is because they fight with their necks. If, you, if you've ever seen a, a video of giraffes fighting, you'll see that they will... There we go. What VM is doing now is he's pointing down the neck and you can sometimes see scarring. And you can see a bit of a scar there on the neck of the giraffe. And that could have been from those ossicones on top of the head there and hitting into that... Into that giraffe's neck so that's when they display dominance much like we saw the buffaloes fighting that's how we would see giraffes fighting so giraffes also fight with, with each other which is mainly the males just the males will fight with one another and that will be over females and access to land and water but mainly females the giraffes will fight over have a look at how this giraffe is eating this tree and you'll find, if you look closely, the giraffe's tongue there is actually quite dark. And the reason why it's quite dark is because it is able to wrap around the tree of an acacia thorn, which is those really, really big thorns, and it doesn't bleed, doesn't bleed with that. So you would have learned that with Brent. So Brent actually told you that, which is great. So we've both been sitting with the giraffe. But in the distance there, I thought I saw a monkey moving around. I think it would be quite cool for us to see some monkeys and some other trees. And in this drainage line, we get all sorts of different trees, from jackalberries that have nice fruits on them to monkeys that climb them. So let's go see if we can find them. So the giraffes having a look at us now. So Serenity would like to know, how do we stay safe out here from the animals? How do we know that they won't hurt us? Well, Serenity, it, it comes with a lot of practice in terms of living out in the bush and learning about how animals behave. And you can always tell if an animal is upset with you. So it's very different being in the vehicle. As you can see, I'm in the vehicle at the moment, and they are very a little bit more relaxed with the vehicles than they are with people because of course, people in the past have hurt animals before, and so they've created a memory around people that they must run away from them. So if this giraffe had to see me standing where I am now when I'm not in a vehicle, let me just switch this off, when I'm not in the vehicle, it would run away straight away. So there we go. So we just have to be, it's all about communication and learning from different animals and learning what they're feeling. So elephants will show you when they're not feeling very happy. So here goes this. So Brent is with a caterpillar. Let's go and see what that caterpillar looks like. We're going to go and see if we can find some monkeys. Look at this. So as we said, it's not all about the big things. Oh. Look at that behavior. So what happened, it just picked up a bit of my breath. The carbon dioxide caused that caterpillar to react. So this is a, a little moth larvae. And you can see it's very hairy. Oh, look at that. Now, if I was a bird, that's to put me off. It's to try to make sure that I know that I don't taste nice or I've got spikes on me, that I'm being threatened. But you can see, that's why you have a lot of these little white tips and black, anything dark, um, I, or, or very light uh, is, is what we'd call aposomatic colouring. So it's warning colourings. 
and you can see because he doesn't really fit the camouflage with the tree that he's in but a really really beautiful little caterpillar now we did get asked about some flowers this guy is eating one of the plants we get here and unfortunately no flowers on this tree but when it does have when it does have flowers they're very pretty it's called the Chinese lantern tree now Carmen was wondering about flowers Carmen we're in our winter months so there are not too many flowers around but fortunately we are in a good spot to show you one of the more interesting flowers we get here here we go let's try to find one that's still got a flower oh, they're almost all finished flowering now there we go there is one flower left here let's have a look down here so here we go there's the one little flower now the rest of these flowers have finished flowering now this flower doesn't even have an English name it's only got a scientific name it's called a Waltharia a Waltharia indica this particular one now the really cool thing about this flower is that it's a very special flower to one type of butterfly so this plant is poisonous but the butterfly caterpillars, similar to the one we've just seen there. So the adult butterfly will lay the eggs often on the underside of the flower, of the leaf, and the, the babies will hatch here and they'll eat this specific plant. And they get hydrogen cyanide poison from this plant. So the acrea butterflies become poisonous when they're adults because the babies eat the poisons in this plant. And that makes them be able to fly around, be relaxed slow moving wings they don't have to worry about birds eating them they're bright orange and black and red and that tells the birds that this is a nasty tasting butterfly you don't want to try eat me and they are very poisonous from eating this particular plant now there are other butterflies that pretend to be the acrea so that's called mimicry so they look very similar to the acrea butterfly they're called pseudo acreas even though they're not poisonous the birds think they might be poisonous so they don't eat them. We might get lucky, Carmen, and find one or two more flowers out on this open area here. So let's go have a look. Well, Autumn is wondering if I've ever seen a flower that lasts through all four seasons. Autumn, unfortunately not. We do have one really cool flower that is our only winter flowering plant uh, and that's called a calancho uh, but it's a succulent so it survives in very dry climates and we can get very very dry during our winter months so far the only flowers I'm seeing oh all the winds caught it let's just wait and be patient so that is a different type of poisonous butterfly not the acrea I don't know if you see him we're gonna wait, try to wait for him to land there we go you got him, Dave? Okay. Um, see this little tree here? Come down to the right. Um, and let me, let's go try to get a bit closer. Let's see if we can find this beautiful orange butterfly. Okay. Oh, one step too many. So there are quite a few butterflies. We're just going to let them settle before we chase after them. You got them there, Dave? two of them a pair of African monarchs now you get monarch butterflies in America and those are also poisonous there we go there we go there they are fluttering you can see they fly very slowly with that nice bright orange coloring to warm the birds that they don't want to eat them very pretty butterfly oh there we go off it goes Let's keep going, let's keep looking for some flowers for Carmen. If we're going to fly flowers, Carmen, it's going to be on this open area here. Uh, this, oh, these open areas are very important for animals. So it is what we call a seep line. And that's where water comes from the top of the hill and it seeps under the ground. So we've got very sandy soil on top and heavy clay underneath. And this means this area is quite heavy with water during the rainy season. And that means that it's a bit too wet for lots of trees to grow. So a lot of grass grows and really good grass grows, is, grows here, so it attracts a lot of the animals. Is 
So Rihanna, very clever Rihanna, would like to find a flower that has mimicry. I will try my best Rihanna, but unfortunately, as I said, at this time of the year, there are very few flowers because we are in our dry season. So in our rainy season, we've got lots of flowers, hundreds of types of flowers, but unfortunately now, turn around there. There we go, there's a butterfly a bit closer. Got him there? There's that African monarch. Oh, off it goes. Very difficult to film butterflies. James, Dave is doing a sterling job. The monarch is also one of the only butterflies we'll have all year round. And Autumn's wondering what are the colors of the poisonous butterfly? Well, generally they're dark colors and bright colors. Black, white, red, orange, and that type of coloring is called aposematic coloring. And that's to warn other animals that it's poisonous. Okay, so we're still in search of flowers. We might get lucky. So far, only the same Waltharias. Just remember, certain flower species out here only flower once every two or three years, and some even only once every ten years. So that what's, that's what makes flowers so interesting for me. They're one of my personal favorite things uh, because they, every year there's a different group of flowers to look for and look at. So, now, what a lot of people don't realize is grass have flowers too, but they're just so small that we can't see them. Unfortunately, these are not flowers, these are seeds. And this is called love grass. Um, and it's named after, I think it's the Greek goddess of love, Eros. So its scientific name is Erogrostus. The, well, basically, love grass. And this particular one is called saw edge de love grass. Now, you do need a little bit of an imagination to pretend that that's a heart, but that's where the name comes from. Okay. Oh, sorry guys, I just need to have to sneeze quickly. Oh, yeah, okay, lots of dust around at the moment. So I didn't hear whose name there, but someone was asking, do we have poison ivy or poison oak here? Alyssa was asking. Alyssa, we don't. Uh, we do have some poisonous uh, plants, but not too many. Uh, the only real bad thing that'll sting your skin when you're walking through the bush yeah, are stinging nettles. And even here, they're quite rare in this area. We only find them around the dry riverbeds and areas like that. Now, what do we have here? So we saw a little caterpillar eating away earlier, and this is a, the same species, and we just spotted another one. Well, he looks similar, but not quite the same. See him there, Dave? And it, could be, it could be the same species, very similar coloring, and the test will be if he does that same defensive posture we saw with the last one. Where did he go? Did he? He jumped. Jumping caterpillar. Well, he escaped. <laughs> when he got my breath. So a lot of insects react to carbon dioxide. So as you know, we breathe in oxygen and nitrogen and whatnot, but mostly oxygen, and we breathe out carbon dioxide. And a lot of little insects and small animals react to that because when something breathes carbon dioxide in them, it means they're about to get eaten. While we continue uh, to see what else we can find for you, let's go see how Sam's doing on the game drive car. Oh, don't worry, you're going to stay with us for a little bit longer. It seems like uh, Sam has ducked into a hole where he doesn't have signal. So I'm keeping on these short grass areas, looking for flowers. Uh, at the same time, I'm always watching up ahead and listening. We don't want to surprise an elephant or a buffalo. Oh, 
Sorry guys, I'm battling here. I'm trying not I'm trying to sneeze, it's just not happening. But we have a look here. This looks like it was a buffalo a long time ago, and this is from its shoulder. Would have been like that since the shoulder. But now even an old piece of bone like this is still utilized by lots of different animals. And if we have a look very carefully, can you see that there, Dave? You can see little teeth marks. Now, porcupines and rodents like mice and rats will come chew on old bones when they're lacking calcium in their diet. Believe it or not, even impala and giraffe will chew bones to get calcium. So even an old piece of bone like this that looks like no one will ever use it is still used by lots of different animals. So Caleb was wondering how many bird species do we get here? So in southern Africa in total, Caleb, we get about 960 bird species. Uh, in the low felt, oh, Steph's found something. Let's go. Let's quickly go. It looked like something exciting. Wonder what it could be. So what has Steph spotted? Could it be a... Ah, a big, big arachnid. And I'm struggling to see it. Here we go, see? Oh, there we go. Okay, I've got... Oh, there we go. <coughs> Very cool. You see it, Dave? Thank you, Steph. Now, oh, there we go. it's a big spider. It's called a garden orb spider. Look at that, isn't that a beautiful big spider? Now, there's a very cool thing in the center of its web. Now, it's caught a grasshopper that she was bu busy encasing. And then, apart from that, if we look here, you see there's a zigzag in the web. It almost looks like a spring. And that's called a stabellum. And what that is there for is to make sure birds don't fly through their nest, uh, through their web. So it's a, to, so the birds can see it, and it's to help the spider protect its web. Because for a spider, it takes an incredible amount of uh, energy to, to spin a web. Now, spider webs are all protein. So if they don't get any food and their web keeps getting broken, it can make, it cause them to become quite distressed. So that's why they put this wonderful, beautiful little zigzag, almost looks like, as I said, a spring in the center of their web to, to try to stop birds flying through it. So we've got a few different types of orb spiders here. And this is the garden orb. You can see she's got that very sort of serrated abdomen. Now, that is the female. The male is tiny. And the male's got to be very careful because if they approach the female in the wrong way, they become dinner like that grasshopper. Beautiful big spider. Now, to give you an idea of how big it is, I'm going to put my hand behind. So you can see how big she is. And I've got big hands. There we go. But Shane, we'll leave her be. Let her finish her spider dinner. So Kenzie is wondering, do we get black widow spiders here? We do, and we get brown widows. There's another name for them, however. It's, uh, sometimes we call them button spiders. So the black button spider is quite often re re referred to as a black widow. And it's a very interesting spider species because it occurs over multiple continents. So it doesn't only occur in Africa. It, it occurs in the Americas and whatnot. And the distinguishing feature for you guys to watch out for uh, because they really like human habitation. So they like being where people live, like tool sheds or garden sheds, places like that, is if you find a small black spider that's very round, right on the back of their bum, there's a red hourglass. So a red, almost eight shape, and that's how you tell a widow spider. So even the brown ones will also have that red or orange eight shape on their bum, uh, the black widow and the brown widow, or as the other name for them is, oh, no, I've forgotten completely. The, uh, <laughs> but we do have other spiders that are far more dangerous 
uh, than widow spiders, and they're called violin spiders, and they ca cause something that's called necrosis. Now, what necrosis is, um, it's a cytotoxic venom. What that means is cell destroying. So we made up of millions of cells. So if you get bitten around the bite size site, your, all your cells start dying and basically rotting. It rots living fresh. And it's a very tiny spider that looks almost like a daddy long legs. And I, they are one of the more common spiders out here in the bush, but they are very shy and retiring. And they normally can be found under all sorts of little bits of branch and whatnot, but it looks like it looks like we're not going to find any on this drive or walk, but guys, Mr. Travato's uh, class, it's been wonderful having you with us on this walk and the drive. So I'm going to say goodbye for Sam and myself, and don't forget, you can always watch us on Safari Live, even when you're not at school, but we have loved having you. Until next time, goodbye. Plus leave. Hello everyone. Thought I'd quickly just get something from the bush here. I know that the kids drive is over, but I thought I'd just quickly show you something before everyone has left. I'm sure you guys have maybe you've left already. Glenwood has been such a great afternoon with those buffaloes especially. Sorry that I'm squinting. The sun's pretty much in my eyes at the moment. But I just thought I'd quickly show you because I collected them. I had a buffalo thorn that is now getting stuck to my car because it's, it's foul. There we go, look at this. So that is a buffalo thorn here. I'm going to put it on the, on the, on this counter. Please excuse me while I just switch off this comms. So that is a buffalo thorn and these thorns are quite sharp. If you have a look at them. They really are quite sharp, so sometimes you can stand on them, but they don't, it really doesn't feel very nice when you stand on those. But what is really nice, when you're really hungry out here in the bush, you can take one of these leaves, without me hurting myself, and you can eat it. It almost tastes a little bit like spinach. See? I can eat it perfectly and it tastes nice. But I'll show you what I wouldn't want to eat, but it is a really well eaten thing by elephants out here, which is the round leaf teak over here. So this is a round leaf teak and the elephants love this plant so much. The elephants will come and they'll take the whole branch itself, much bigger of course, try and imagine a much longer branch and then it puts it in there and then it just mulls it and chews off all the leaves like that. Well mainly it'll go this way and pull off all the leaves. So that is one way of collecting and eating round leaf teak by an elephant, which is fascinating, isn't it? And lastly, hi there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, eh? Are you off on, did you see Karilla that side? She's over here. Okay, thanks so much. Cheers, eh? That was nice. Someone just wished me happy birthday, which is nice. And finally, this is the silver cluster leaf. So if you would have seen on my uh, if you had a look on the Rewild page, on my Facebook page, you can see the different types of leaves and the compound structure of different leaf structures. And this is the cluster leaf, which is, gives name to the silver cluster leaf. I'll put it over here because that makes it easier for them. And this plant is not well loved by all the different animals out here. Why? Because it has a different form of defense. So this leaf, this one has a mechanical defense with all those thorns around there. This one, the silver cluster leaf, has a chemical defense. So this one will try and get away from the animals by fighting it with its swords. And this one will create a chemical within the leaf itself that when you eat it, oh, it's horrible. Your whole mouth just tangs up and it just is not very nice. But it's interesting to think that not only have animals evolved to survive out in the bush, but plants have evolved in different ways to try and protect themselves out here in the bush, both chemically and mechanically. So that was just a little lesson on plants. And we are off now. Let's just take all these plants and take them out of the car. And I'm going to put on my birthday hat quickly, because I think it's cool. So there's my birthday, and I want to wear my hat. It's 
quite funny. We were sitting, we were sitting with some elephants earlier, myself and Viem, and I put this hat on, and the elephants. You would have probably seen it on the dam cam earlier if you were watching there. The elephants came right up to my vehicle and almost looked at me quite funny and said, "How's this guy wearing this hat on his head? It looks quite strange." So I took it off quite gently just to show them that I wasn't a threat. I mean, it is quite a weird thing to see. If you're an elephant, you just see this guy with a cap on and then this huge, big blue hat. It almost looks like a, like a horn of some sort. So <laughs> looks like I'm wearing a big blue horn on my head. But we are off to Cheetah Plains now to see if maybe we can find a jackal on my birthday. I'd love to see if I can find a side striped jackal or a black back jackal. If not those, Cheetah, if not that, big open plains. And what we will see is the sunset. So even if we drive there to watch a magical sunset over the beautiful African savannah, I'll be very happy with that. And there's going to be a nice moon out tonight. The moon has been growing bigger and bigger in the sky. Uh, so I've just found out I'm not able to go to Cheetah Plains. No worries. We'll make our way down Cheetah Cut Line and see what might be happening at Bifflesworth Dam this afternoon. Might be, there might be some elephants that might be walking around there. I'd like to see some more elephants. But what would even be better is, is, you know, there were lions that went off in, into this property to the right of us as we drive down here. And those were, so those tracks headed in a easterly direction. So maybe they've moved off back into our area. We know that the Birminghams are just down here in Chitwa, Chitwa Chitwa, and the females that were drinking at the dam earlier. Do we have some tracks there, Viam? Uh, so the females and the Birminghams are not the are not far away from us. I'm not sure which females it is. I think it is the Inkuhumas, but they are apparently feeding on a buffalo kill not far away from us. So maybe later on in the evening, if they haven't killed, finished off the kill already, they might just move off into our property, which would be awesome. So we will be listening out for anything that might be happening. I'd love to see some lions today had the most magical view of those buffaloes hitting each other though. It was incredible. Just for that children's drive as well. So they got to see how animals really interact with each other. So just standing here, we've got some impalas that are right here in the area. I'm actually going to take this hat off because although it's awesome and blue and cool, I think it's quite a distraction for all the animals out here. So we're out here to view animals. So let's see what we, not only animals, but plants and all the rest. So this looks like a harem of females that this male over here would have been courting. And there's an impressive looking kudu male in the distance. So we often find impala. So I'm going to come and maybe see some impala later. I'd rather show you this really, really impressive looking kudu that's about to move into the bush here. There's a female there with, with him as well. So I noticed that, you know, I know that some of our South African la language is not as easy to follow as what you guys could be useful, used to. I know that you don't use the word as well. <laughs> so it just means with them. So there is the kudu. That's a large male kudu there. Have, have a look at how impressive those horns are. And sometimes those horns can get really, really big and long. And then they fight against each other. But you can see that this kudu here is browsing on some leaves. And this is the ideal area you would find the kudu. There's also a female that's walking to the right of it there, coming into frame with the male. And you'll, this is the area that you would find groups of kudus where there is some thickets. And they can, they've got really, really big ears where they'll be able to listen out for anything that might be moving around the bush. But I was reading a study, I think a couple, that's a young male there. Actually. That's a young male there that you can see. There's two little horns coming out there. So 
one day his horns might grow much like the elder one that is here. There's the female that's walking off there. So it looks like a nice little family group here, walking together. And I was just saying, I read an interesting study the other night about how big male kudus will fight with each other once, sometimes. And sometimes when they fight with each other, their horns are so long that they actually become interlocked with each other. And in that process of fighting and becoming locked in, they cannot unlock themselves. So they become in this position where they're trying to pull out of this lock and they can't. And of course, that makes it a lot easier for predators to come out and kill. So there's been reports on lions coming and finding kudus that are stuck together like that and obviously makes quite an easy kill. And that young one has got its ears pointed out towards us listening for any sounds. So those ears are almost the size of their head. One ear is the size of one, the whole head of that kudu. And they're very, they can move in all sorts of directions to help collect any sound that might be happening out here in the bush. Quite clearly see those horns now of that male. So let's drive a little closer now. It's quite nice when you start at a distance because then they start, I think, I feel that maybe they get a little bit more comfortable with us. So as we get close to this kudu, maybe they'll move off. We're going to go towards, um, towards Bufflesuk Dam to see what might be lurking around there. In the time being, let's go and see how Brent is doing. So we often get asked about the local people here and this area has probably been ha habitated for well over a couple of thousand years initially with the Bushmen and then the Nguni tribes coming down. And it's not that often here on Juma we actually find sign of human habitation but we actually have some here. This is probably not that old at the oldest, probably a couple of hundred years old but it's really in here. But it's been broken but it is a, a milling stone. So corn or, 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 or maize would have been put onto here and then if you look around carefully sometimes you can find the other parts. So it would have been put on here by the ladies and then ground. So it would have rolled with a, around a rock and it's actually worn a section in here. Now I've found some probably about six, seven hundred years old at home uh, along the riverbed at home where there's quite a lot, uh, much bigger, deeper ones. but. Now, the reason we know this is definitely from human habitation and, and not uh, sort of a naturally occurring rock, this rock has to have been carried here. This, this, this type of rock, it's a gabbro rock. Let's see if I can... And they're often very big. Um, now, so this type of rock doesn't occur naturally in this area. So it has to have been carried here. Probably the closest place that these rocks occur... Oh, I mean, look at this. It's actually a massive stone. And that's not uncommon with grinding stones. So I don't think I'm going to be able to dig this out. Um, you can see, and they, they're often chosen for their, for their shape with that slight indentation. And so this is probably carried, I'm trying to think, the closest place oh, is maybe up in the Manialetti, uh, probably 15, 20 k's, possibly down to the south, sort of, uh, no, sorry, the northeastern corner of Buffalo's Hook. So this stone had to have been carried here, and it's definitely not going to be an elephant that does that. It's going to be a person. Now, if we had had to, I mean, if we excavated in this area, we would, might be able to find some uh, pottery shards, uh, beads even. And unfortunately, if we think about a lot of the in indigenous people who, who lived in these areas, uh, their, their, their housing and stuff was made out of natural material, so it doesn't last. So often all we find is things like grinding stones and, and pieces of pottery. Now, generally broken pottery, uh, pottery that's been broken and discarded. It's very, very rare to find uh, a completely enclosed pot. Now, I've looked in a lot of termite mounds here, and I haven't been lucky yet, but about 60 kilometers from here, uh, where I live, I've actually found a termite mound that used to be a kiln. Uh, so basically an old art fark burrow that's been dug out and fire would have been made in it 
and, uh, and then the pot glazed or baked inside there to make them hard. The interesting thing about that particular termite mound is that it's actually also a hyena den. So <laughs> every time the hyenas move and they dig and they, they dig up, you find other bits of pottery there. And I actually sent that pottery uh, through to the University of Pretoria and, they, and they're aged at about 800 years old, which is quite old for the low felt. So very interesting. So we're going to keep out on foot for now and hopefully the tech team will have fixed uh, Jigger shortly and we'll be able to get out in vehicles. So looks like we might get the best of both worlds, a walk and a, and a drive. No. And we've been watched. I've been watching him for a while and he definitely knows we're there. We have a nice big male giraffe. We're not going to walk directly at him. I don't want to disturb him. And that gusting wind earlier, we disturbed the two females. Uh, we don't want to disturb him. We'll let him be. So we're just going to walk obliquely across from him. And you will just watch his head. He'll just swing and follow us. Uh, Monty would like to know, do lions hunt giraffe often? Yes and no. Again, a lot of that type of behavior is area specific rather than species specific. And they do hunt giraffe in the Sabi Sands. Normally it's, it's, it's more coalitions of males, although it by no means out of a, a pride like the Unkahuma's capabilities. But normally it is coalition males. And I have heard of a couple of giraffe being hunted to the north of us in Buffalo's Hook. But I haven't seen any on Juma so far. But uh, when I worked in the southern Sabi Sands, the coalition of males called the Mapojos, a very famous coalition of males, actually used to hunt giraffe regularly. I think in the two years that I saw them regularly, uh, I think they killed about nine adult male giraffe, which is no mean feat. I mean, they weigh 2,000 kilograms. And you can see, because we're not walking directly at him, he just hasn't moved an inch. And he's just standing there. And he was watching us. Now he's not even looking at us. He might even start feeding again. And you can see he's missing the tip to his tail. That can quite often be from lions or hyenas when they're younger. Hey, mister. Now he's doing exactly what I was hoping the other giraffe would do earlier if we display non-predatory behavior and just sort of walk past them, keep talking normally, don't act like we're trying to stalk them. And always when you stop to look at something, we find something really interesting. And before we look at this little flower on the ground, Tony would like to know, can a giraffe to my knowledge, be ridden by a horse. Tony, I've never heard of it. Maybe you can be the first. I doubt, if you look at that slot on their back, that it would be a very comfortable ride. But probably one of the last flowers we're going to see nice and clearly for the, the season. And it is a, a large devil thorn flower. And I've been waiting for this because we've seen the flower quite often, but we actually haven't seen the seed. Now, if you have an impish side to you like I do, these seeds are great fun. So they're very specifically designed. And they're actually designed, if you are an ungulate with a hoof, and you're walking and you've got that gap between your hooves, so it's designed to get stuck in between the hooves. And that's how this particular plant disperses its seed. So if you see an impala or wildebeest walking quite often with a limp, it could be one of these large devil thorns stuck inside there. <laughs> Dave's quite impressed with that. He's saying, wow. Now, as I said, if you have an impish side, uh, they're the bush version of the drawing pin on the chair. So <laughs> you can pick a few. Uh, you can either do the handshake trick where you, you just stick it in there and then you go shake someone's hand with the thorns on the inside or you can pop it on a chair. Uh, Dave, do you, do you think we should play a trick on, 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 on John Ray tonight? I think I think we should keep this for Jean-Dre. Maybe we'll do it while we're doing the after-drive catch-up. 
and we can watch Jeanre yelp in pain. So while we continue on, see what else we can find and leave the giraffe who is very, very interested in what we've got to say. Uh, Sam is with uh, a bird of prey and we'll see you a little later. So we've been waiting patiently with this white-backed vulture, as you can see here, standing on a knob thorn, an old knob thorn, much like what we saw this morning down by Buffelsuk Dam. So it is awesome to be sitting with a vulture again. And it looks like it's, it has been sitting there for quite some time. So it's, it's a solitary vulture. We can't see many more, any others around us but now that we have got you here we're going to slowly move forward towards this vulture and potentially there might be some more that would be around this area and maybe there could be a kill there we never know that's what vultures do they look they circle the skies during the day in the thermals and then they come down and they feed on some of the old kills that have been around here so let's move forward slightly maybe there's something there but even better, maybe it will fly off and have a look at that wi those wings of the vulture when it flies off. But what would be even better, there's going to be a picture of the moon in the, in the background of this vulture. It will be such an amazing picture. If you want to get a screenshot of a vulture with the moon above it. Have a look at that, that looks really, really cool. So that is what you call a waxing moon. The moon is getting bigger and bigger towards a full moon. There it is. And you can see the little ra well, rabbit in the moon there, the ears in the moon on the left, top left. You can see that rabbit that's starting to come out now. It's been a whole moon since I've been here. I've seen one full moon since I've started Safari Live. It's been incredible. And here we are a white back vulture. So great camera work there from VM. So that's a magical shot there of a white back vulture and a moon in the distance. So we are hoping now that we might be able to see some more white back vultures around here. You can quite clearly see while we're looking at that head. You can see the beak there. The beak is you can see it looks quite powerful, much like an eagle has that powerful beak structure. That is to rip into the carcasses to get to the meat that it needs. And it's not one of the most dominant vultures that you get out here. The most dominant one that we get, which we saw the other day actually, and I was with VM when we saw it, was the lappet faced vulture, which has a significant red on its beak. And that is the lappet. It's much, much, much bigger than this one. And the lapid face likes to chew and eat on flesh. So it will rip out the skin and that sort of stuff. This one would be eat some of the meat on it. So that is a white back vulture. Looked really, really cool with the moon behind it there. Let's move on. Let's go and see what might be at Buffelsuk Dam this afternoon. It doesn't look like there are many other people out. So this property is literally here for us to explore on our own. So me and Viam are looking out for any tracks that might be around here. It doesn't look like there are any other vultures in the area other than this one white back vulture. No, the, tra the trees are looking fairly bare from white back vultures. So let's head off. Let's go and see what we can find this afternoon. So this morning, there was quite a significant group of elephants that were walking through here and we were hoping they were going to go to the watering hole but the drive ended just as we were looking for them. There could very well be some more elephants down by that watering hole now. But Torchwood is on our right here and so there are a number of different elephants, well not elephants, leopards and different prides of lions that have been moving around this property recently as well as Bilfelsuk. And this morning we, we drove quite a fair amount of Juma to see if there were any tracks or anything moving around and it, it seemed pretty empty. Both Brent and I looked and searched and scanned the area for anything. But we had such a great view of the hyenas though, which was very cool. So there doesn't seem to be any more vultures. And vultures, as I said, they just can 
you know, when you go tracking and, and looking for bush or things in the bush, tracks and signs, a vulture is a sign of activity, much like a bird is a sign of movement because they show an alarm display, they alarm at a, at a leopard that will be in the area. So tracking is the art of listening, really. It's the art of paying attention and being aware of what's going on around you, from even a buffalo, the oxpeck on top of a buff buffalo, to the monkey on top of a tree alarming at a predator below, because monkeys will often alarm at leopards that are walking in the area. It has a nice looking hornbill, yellow-billed hornbill. A friend used to call it a flying banana. So it looks like it's got a banana on its beak, the yellow-billed hornbill. So it's a, it's a bird that we see quite often here, but it really, I'm just gonna switch off for a second. It really looks pretty in that light. It's the light sh shines on that beak. I love the way they walk. They've also got such a fascinating walk, these yellow-billed hornbills. And we get two others. We get the gray hornbill and we get the red billed hornbill. So the two that we often see are the yellow billed and the red billed. The gray, not as often. Let's see if we can find the, the, the fun. The, we get four, so we get the ground hornbill as well. It's the red one. That red beak. We saw that on Cheetah Plains the other day. All right, so we're going to carry on. Brent's going to give you. Brent's going to. I'm not sure where, where or what he's doing, but I think he's just got one last segment for the afternoon. Let's go through to Brent and see how he's doing. So we're making our way back to our camp because we're going to go swap Shank's pony uh, for the game drive vehicle. So we're going to get the best of both worlds, a nice little stroll, and then out on drive. But since we were talking about human habitation earlier, I just saw a little, probably a bone shard from an impala. And I'm going to keep this little bone shard. And on one of the next safaris, I'm going to go find the right tools. I'm going to go back in time even beyond where that milling stone was and to the sort of late, late, sorry, yeah, the late stone age uh, where you started using very sharp little flints and even bone to make sharp points, little knives. So I'm going to keep this and I'm see if we can find some other bones and maybe the next time out on foot I'll have a traditional hunter's kit and we can see if we can make an arrowhead or a spearhead or, or something like that. So very interesting little things, and if you look carefully in the bush, there's so many different things that you can utilize. So we're nearly back at the camp. Hi, Cat uh, in Tampa. Cat would like to know, do animals look bigger to me uh, on foot than in the vehicle? Um, it's a very interesting uh, question, Cat. Not necessarily, but... Uh, I think I've, I've been very lucky that I've spent an inordinate amount of time on foot and in the vehicle. And uh, of course, each has got its benefits. But I must say, maybe elephants. Elephants can look a lot bigger. Uh, and definitely a male lion when he's charging. But generally not. I think, I think with those situations, uh, experience and instinct take over. So you're not really worried about the size of what you're looking at. You, you're looking at those tiny little sort of giveaway, especially with elephant, about how they behave, are they upset, are they happy that you're there, are they going to tolerate your presence, um, is there a safe escape route. So I don't think you're really thinking about the size, you're thinking about all the other stuff that sort of runs through your, through your mind very quickly. Now, we've just been chatting about human habitation, and one of the best places to look for signs of early man, so going a bit further back than that grinding stone, wherever you see a little bit of erosion like this. So on these eroded areas, uh, because there could be stone tools from anywhere up on the hill that water is brought down, and it's always a good spot, and I've searched really hard on Juma, but I haven't found any hominin to tools yet, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to at some stage. So every time I walk through a little eroded area, especially when there's nice bits of quartz, just always have a careful look to see if it's a clean break or it's a, a worked break. And uh, I do have quite a lot of stone tools at home, but I'm still hoping to find one here on Juma, or maybe even on Cheetah Plains might be a good idea to look 
in that sort of western section, some of the deeper drainage lines there. And of course, always a good place to look for kitty cat tracks. Although the kitty cats are proving to be a bit difficult. As I said, I'm hoping the shaving of my weak attempt at a beard will bring the cats out. So Tim's wondering how concerned I am about walking into a poisonous snake or a venomous snake. But Tim, not at all actually. I actually look forward to it. Uh, most of the snakes are far more scared of us than we are of them and they'll generally try and move away. But fortunately sometimes birds and other things will alarm call and we might will be able to get to see the snakes and uh, we've actually had some fantastic sightings of snakes on bushwalk in particular uh, the the boom slung and uh, which is basically translated to tree snake which is a, a bat fang venomous snake uh, but poses very little threat to humans we spent an incredible i think it was about a half an hour 45 minutes watching this boom slung hunt through the trees so i really like seeing venomous snakes we've seen some really great mambas um, some puff adders Trying to think what other snakes we've seen on bushwalk. So, Tim, just to make you short, uh, venomous, so snakes, scorpions, spiders, uh, is different from a poisonous thing. So poison is ingested, you have to eat it, whereas venom is injected. So a snake, spider, scorpion injects venom. Uh, for something to be poisonous, you'd have to eat it. So if this was a poisonous tree, which it's not, but there's one right here. So let's go to that. So here we go, it's a little Timberti tree. And if we pull that there, you see that little white spot there. That's poisonous latex. So if I had to eat this, it would be poison. And if I did have to eat this, I would be throwing up quite quickly. Highly, highly noxious, but sometimes poison is medicine. And a lot of the animals, if they've got a, a bad stomach uh, problem with lots of uh, tapeworms or flukes, they'll eat a poisonous tree like Timberti, causing, causing the system to purge. So elephants, black rhino, giraffe, kudu, baboon, will all eat the specific tree to help purge their system. I'm not going to need to eat this to purge my system. Uh, I think I would be very, very ill if I had to eat even just the smallest leaf. Even if you cook on dry Timberti wood, uh, you can get sick from the smoke that goes into the meat. And even if you just smell Timberti wood on a fire, uh, the smoke can make you highly, highly nauseous. But uh, fortunately, only people who are not really from the bush make that mistake and they generally only make it once. Okay, so we're going to go jump back in the vehicle. So we'll see you shortly. Uh, in the meantime, let's jump back on board with Sam, who's got some footprints in the sand. Welcome back everyone, we are here with a zebra track and I know that James Richard was very keen to see a zebra track. As you can see it's over here, I'm actually going to use a little stick. That is our zebra track in the middle there. So you can quite clearly see the top there and the hoof structure coming back down over there. So this, this uh, zebra looks like it was moving in a forward direction, I just drew an arrow. So it was moving in a forward direction up towards Cheetah Cut Line where, where we were just now. But what's fascinating about where we are at the moment is the sun is coming from that direction. And this is one of the best times to go tracking is during the sunset times and the sunrise times. That's the main reason why we come out at that time of day because you can see these tracks quite easily. Because when it's at a slant you can kind of see the shadow of it. So that's why it was quite easy for us to spot. We also just saw a leopard, not so fresh, probably about within the last 12 hours that that leopard walked there, which is just up, just up there. So we're going to follow the tracks that come down here. It looked like the tracks headed off in that direction of the leopard. So we're going to go around and see what we can find. But I just spotted this as well. And this over here looks like the urine from the zebra. So that very well could be the urine of that zebra. And, and it looks like it was quite a few of them. Because when I'm looking down the road here, yeah, I can see quite a few tracks. So it looked like it was a 
dazzle of zebra that came and walked up here and urinated where I just pointed, which was fascinating to see that. So there we go, James Richard. There is your zebra track. Let's head off towards the sun and see what we can find. I know that Brent has left us on the bush walk now, so we'll be driving for quite a bit and seeing what we can find. So let's have a nice slow drive towards Buffles Look Down. Potentially there might be something there. His Elvis looks like he's about a four lift. Let's put him back on nicely there. It's Elvis the Ellie. Elvis, which way should we go? Should we turn right or left? Well, we're going to Buffles Oak Dam, Elvis, so we have to go right. Towards the sun, we go. It's been a fantastic day today. The sun has been great. It's just been quite warm, but not that hot for a nice long run today, probably about five kilometers. All right, so we're going to leave that sun for a bit and come down here. Albeard would like to know, how do we tell a track, or a newer track from an older track? So, Albeard, there's a, a number of signs that you can have a look at. Often tracks, you'll find there's a lot of sand on top of that track that would have been maybe from wind that's blown into that. So you'll find some rubble, um, sometimes also you'll see that there will be leaves in it from elephants walking past. Sometimes there's another track on top of that track which will show you that it's older. And um, yeah, sometimes there's tire tracks on top of them. So there's all sorts of signs and um, that will show you that a track is older. But when it's new and fresh, there's a, a look about it. Would you agree, Vim? Is that look where it just looks like it's just been printed in that ground. It's you'll just see that perfect indentation. So what we saw there was not a perfect indentation of a, of a leopard, leopard track. So it looked like it had been sitting there for about 12 to 15 hours. Would you agree, Vian? Yeah, about 12 to 15 Last hours. Night. Last night. So maybe that leopard is in this thicket here. We're not able to drive in there. So what, what is happening? It's coming to the end of the day. The sun is going down and leopards are nocturnal creatures. So they might just come down for something to drink in the evening. If we're lucky, that's if we are exceptionally lucky, that leopard will walk down and get something to drink down by the watering hole. So I'm in no rush to get down to the watering hole. Let's see what we might be able to see on the way here. We've got quite a bit of elephant tracks, some dung in front of us. James Richard is saying thanks for the zebra track. No worries, James. Just for any other viewer that was interested in learning more about tracking and what we just saw, um, here was that zebra track that we just saw there. So that's what we saw in the ground just now. So it's around five centimeters big and, yeah, well, sorry, 10, 10 to 14 centimeters big. So it's interesting. It has that V shape at the back. That's what gives it away with the zebra track. And the track that we saw maybe a couple meters just behind that track was the leopard track, which is that one over here. And they had that significant indentation at the back of that track. So that's what we just saw. That's from our little tracking book. This thing has helped me so much from my days of training. So let's see what we can find. I just also want to send a really, really big thank you not only, to not only everyone in my camp, from VM to all the guys in the camp, but um, also to to all the viewers that have been out there and wishing me a happy birthday. Of course, it will take me a long time to, to send a thank you to everyone. And I don't really use Facebook unless I'm using the Rewild page. And so I just want to say thank you very much for all your posts on my birthday. It's really, really great to, to get all your messages. And yeah, I'm very grateful and appreciative of it. So thank you. Yeah, we are driving down towards Buffalo. Love driving towards the sun. It just looks really, really beautiful as the, the sun comes through here. And you know, this is also. Can you see how when you look at the at the light here in the in the grass, you can see patches of light as the light comes through here. The dappling. 
Sorry, Rebecca, what did you say? Rebecca. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca said it's called the dappling of the sun. <laughs> I thought you said dappling of the sun. Well, when you have a look at, you know, many of the species out here from the, the bucks that like to live out here, like the bushbuck, the Inyala, and the kudu, they have that dappling effect on their bodies, and that's what helps them kind of sink into this environment, especially at these times of day. They look like they've got all that dappling on, the, on their coat. So if we see a kudu and Inyala, I'll show you how there's little white spots around around them it helps them give that effect. So it's it's all about camouflage out here. Smelling camouflage to get away from the big predators such as the lion leopard, the wild dog. So there is a lot of evidence here. Not only of zebra, this dazzle of zebra have been moving through here. There's lots of evidence here of elephants. But we were talking about how do we tell the difference between you know, dung or, or tracks that are fresh and not so fresh. Well, dung can also tell us a lot and you can track by looking at dung. And if you pick up a piece of elephant dung, you'll find that it will be really, really dry inside if it's old. And if it's quite fresh, if it's fresh dung, like it's moist and wet, that means that the elephant was passing by quite recently. And from what I'm seeing with all this dung here, it looks quite dry. So these elephants were here quite, quite a while ago, maybe two two days ago. We are coming down to the watering hole now, slowly but surely. Just looking into the bushes left and right, just in case something might be lying up in the bush. Aaron, Aaron needs one more bird for his bird list to get to 50. Aaron, I promise you I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. There's a bird on top there. What is that? It looks like a starling from there. Yeah, I think it is a virtual starling. Oh, hold on. Could be a jonga. On this distance, no, it's a, it's a virtual starling. I saw that iridescence there. So I think I'm sure you've got that already, Aaron. Let's continue. So we're down by the watering hole, Aaron. So this is probably the best place we can find a water, water nesting bird. This is where we saw the gymnogene this morning, which was so cool to see that gymnogene jumping from tree to tree. And it was getting mobbed by all those drongos. So at the moment it looks pretty empty here down by the watering hole. Let's see if we can spot anything. So there's a bird that's running around the bottom there. Let's have a quick look and see what that is. Oh, it looks like a three-banded plover. That's what it is. Three-banded plover. Have you got that yet, Aaron? I also saw that the other day, so you could very well have already had that one. Let's see what else might be lurking around the watering areas this afternoon. It seems quite empty out here, but maybe if we drive around, we might hear or see something. But just in this tree here, we have a buffalo we've had. Sorry about the scratching sounds in the sound there. My lapel just fell down from my shirt. So you should be able to hear me well. There we go. So now there is the buffalo weaver nest, the red-billed buffalo weaver nest. So I'm sure you've got this bird already. There's a bird, there's two actually on the right here. If we look into the tree here, there's two buff red-billed buffalo weavers that have just come out the nest. So they've just jumped back in there. I'll just get into a position where you can see them there. There we go. You can see the, the tail of... Oh, I'm going to switch off. You can see that tail of the red-billed buffalo weaver just sitting there. And there's another one that's there. And these, these red-billed buffaloes will be moving all the way around here to collect little twigs to make these really, really big nests. But 
we're not going to stick around with the red bull buffalo weavers because we are on a mission to see if we can find another bird. There goes the sun today on the 17th of May, which has been a fantastic day. So we're about to go into a dip where our signal might just lose for a couple seconds. So don't worry, we'll come back. This dip goes down into the drainage line and then comes back out on the other side of the watering hole. So just prepare. We might lose you for a couple seconds. But don't you worry, we'll be back. Hopefully Aaron with another bird. There's a beautiful shot of the sun coming down through these trees. Awesome. There goes the sun. So let's also keep a little bit quiet as we come down here because there's often well, something that might be lying down to the left of it. It looks like a really big elephant bull was walking down here. So we're just coming out the drainage line now. So. David Strachan. Let's have a look at that view for a second. See if we can see anything. We've got a, a starling in the tree there. But uh, David Strachan just said, Sam, I saw you eating some plants today. Did you eat a silver cluster leaf and happy birthday? David Strachan, how's it my mate? A really good friend of mine. He works at London Losey. Nice to see you and have you on drive with us. Um, I did eat that silver cluster leaf a little bit earlier, Dave, and it didn't taste so nice. But I wanted to show the kids, you know, that that's, the silver cluster leaf really, really doesn't taste that good and how it is a chemical defense. So you would have agreed with me, I'm sure, David. Thanks for joining us on our safari, Dave. We're actually trying to find a bird this evening. It seems quite empty out here on Buffelswick watering hole. But there is a good, good chance we might be able to find something. All we have to do is be patient and enjoy the drive. So let's go down Buffelshook West Road to see what we might be able to find. And if David is watching, he knows what it's, all, what it's about going around and, and learning all your different roads on, your, on the property. It's quite a fun and exciting adventure. Sometimes you get lost, sometimes you don't. Where, where David was, he was at Londolosi, we had to do seven days of walking, seven days where you have to walk through the bush felt and learn the different roads. It's not only just learn the roads, but also be comfortable in the bush with all the different ecologies out here. Well, the niche of the elephant and how the leopard or cheetah know how to act in those environments. And you go out there with a map and you just go, and it's probably the most exciting time of my life I've ever had to go out into wilderness, into deep wilderness with just a map. And, and to go looking and, and learning roads and figuring out all the different species of the bush. It's, it's, it's a huge life lesson that I've had. You know, Dave's also had that. So here I am learning the roads of Juma, David. Also Arethusa and Cheetah Plains. Hoping. Hoping we can find something through here. Jilly in the UK, I'm going to drive up here and see what we might be able to find. Jilly in the UK would like to know a little bit more about cloud structures and, you know, what kind of cloud structures we might get. Yes, Jilly, in the future I will definitely do that. That's, a, that's an easy request to do, um, purely purely because we do get quite a few different cloud formations here from Culeo Nimbus to Alto Stratus to Cirrus, which is the higher higher clouds up in the sky so I will definitely have a look out and see and show you and explain to you how that all works. Here we go up through this thicket. I'm really Aaron I'm searching for birds around here. I feel like I'm trying to present but also I have binoculars in my eyes. <laughs> it's 
if I can, I'll show you that silver cluster leaf again that David was talking about, that you shouldn't eat. What you can eat to show people how other how plants will defend themselves. So this is my favorite time of day that we're coming to now. This evening sunlight as the bush awakens for the nocturnal time. So much as we are diurnal creatures, many, many different nocturnal creatures. Okay, so we're going down into another dip here where we might be able to find some creatures that will be lurking and willing to come out. Here's the silver cluster leaf that I was talking about with David. Really is a beautiful, beautiful tree, but those, and you can see that prominent cluster there, and if you take a bite of that leaf, it's not gonna taste very nice. So there we go, I've now shown you. So if you come here and you eat a silver cluster leaf, I've warned you that it doesn't taste very nice. So I've warned you twice here, and I even showed you how it's not nice to eat. <laughs> so here we go. There's a bird that's just flown into this tree here. Let's go and see what bird that might be with the sun behind it. So we don't have much time for sun. It just flew off. That bird just flew off. Aaron, doing my best here. Sometimes when you're really looking for something, it doesn't find it, you know, it kind of has to find you out here. That's what I find so interesting. Some mornings I'll be like, no, I'm going to go find a jackal or something. And you don't end up finding it because you've just closed your mind off just to seeing something. So you have to be quite open-minded to seeing everything out here because it's all just an open canvas every time you go out. And of course you can track, track for those animals. But you just never know what you're going to find every day. So you just want to pay attention. Over here we've got a termite mound that is inactive. This is an inactive termite mound over here. You often find plants and trees that might be growing out of it. So that is a compretum tree that's growing out of it. And termites... So... So termites like to, to build these big termite mounds all the way around here. We know that it's an inactive mound purely because it has a number of holes in it. So you know that active mounds have dirt over the holes that cover up the holes there. And you can also see a, quite a difference between the color of the soil of the patched up soil around the holes. So that is the difference. And of course I've explained a few times within biomimicry how how we are learning from the designs of the natural world and applying them to human systems to make our systems a little bit more efficient, you know, from trees to termite mounds and how they actually built, they built a building that is using the science of a termite mound to try and regulate temperature instead of having so many, you know, air conditioners throughout the building. How do you build a building so that it has a natural air conditioner much like a termite mound? So there's a lot of ingenuity and thought that's starting to come out in terms of how do we start learning from the natural world and, and learn from the science that's been here for so much longer than us. And that's, that's where my fascination has really come, has been learning about the different species, the animals, the birds, the flowers that have been here for a lot longer than us and have survived on their own in these environments. They can teach us a lot. So that's one of my biggest passions. This evening we'll be very lucky if we can find the Orion's belt that will come out this evening and the Scorpio's out and I would love to do a few talks on some of our closest stars. And there's a beautiful sunset that's coming here. Let's go and have a quick little gaze at that sunset. Wow, Glenwood Elementary, it's been a pleasure, it was great to have you. How cool were those buffaloes fighting against each other, that sound of that 
those bosses hitting each other were quite significant. And you said you've sung me a song on Twitter. Thank you guys. I really, really appreciate it if you're still watching. Let's just watch the sun tip. I'm trying to get to a nice position. So let's stop and watch the sun go down after another beautiful day in the bush. I can just hear the sound of a Shelley's Franklin. Sounds so that sound of the Shelley's Franklin sounds like it's saying, Go drink a beer, go drink a beer. <laughs> so that was the sound of the Shelley's Franklin. So there goes the sun after another fantastic day out in the bush. Take some deep breaths in. It's been a long day at work for many, many people, or some people are still at work. And we are watching the last little shine of sun before we come into the night time and we're going to see if we can find you a bush baby this evening and James, Richard, Aaron, maybe there'll be a night char that comes out or a water thick knee that we might be able to catch, well not catch of course, to see and then we can get your list to 50. So let's head off. We're going to go down into this drainage line, see if we can pick up any tracks of a leopard that might be walking through the area and any birds that might be lurking. In the meantime, let's go and see how Brent is doing. He's now back and up on his vehicle. We'll see you just now. So, from foot to the vehicle. Now, I'm sitting in this particular spot for a very particular reason. And it's not to sneeze, which is going to happen shortly, it feels like it. But a little birdie told me that there's a leopard heading towards this boundary. And it's a leopard we haven't seen in a while. So I'm hoping she pops up shortly. I'm just waiting for an update on the radio. So I gave it away. It is a she. Now, which she is it is the next question. exciting. It must be because I shaved. The leopards didn't like my attempted beard. So I'm just listening to the game drive. So why don't you guys try and guess which leopard are we waiting to spot? Send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. listening for the vehicles as they move. So somewhere around that group of trees there. And we're hoping she's just going to wander like that. Maybe scent mark a little bit over there. Scent mark a little bit over there. And then come visit us in Juma. So we've got a guess in from Ryan. Is it Sakani? Well, Ryan, I don't know. So since we're waiting for a predator, Brian from Toronto is wondering if two predators got into a fight, would one eat the other if it won? Sometimes, Brian, uh, not always, quite often predators will just kill the other predator and not eat it. But I have seen lions kill and eat other lions and even eat hyenas occasionally. And hyenas 
will probably eat everything. But that's because they're a hyena and they're the ultimate scavenger. Just hang on a second. I thought I saw a glimmer of movement there. Aaron thinks it could be Tandy. Again, I don't know. Sakani, Tandy, might be both. Sorry, guys, I just need to listen carefully to this for a second. Dave can show you the moon. Sorry about this, but uh, I have to listen quite carefully. It's quite a lot of vehicle movement and quite a lot of vehicle chatter. Station controlling the lineup for Shadow, please come in. Lots of radio chatter. I'm just trying to make sure we get this exactly right. And I think I gave it away. I did, didn't I? Dag Navis. Well, we creep a little bit further up the road. seem to get hold of the guys there. Samal says, where am I? But I think, unfortunately, I already gave it away when I was on the radio there, Samal. So we're actually waiting to try to see Shadow. She was... We are at the junction of the Triple M and Gary Man. So I can see the vehicles there, but I can't see her. So we're just going to move off the road slightly. Stand by. She might just tempt us and then just decide to not come all the way across. See, I think she's in a tree. Stand by here, because if she does get moving, very really likely she's going to head straight towards us here. You see anything there? Nope. I think she's in that thicket, that little combitum thicket there. So we're just going to wait here. If you zoom into the left of the vehicle, left slightly, left slightly, and up uh, right slightly, and up in the tree. Those spots. 
I think she's in that tree there. So I heard So apparently you can't hear me. Um, I think everything's okay outside. So, uh, of course, patience is a very important thing when it comes to seeing leopards. And hopefully she's going to move across back towards Juma. So I'm going to sit here quietly and wait. So this is a great opportunity if you have any questions about leopards. Pop me an email, questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, some of you might not believe me, but I promise there is a leopard really close to us. I'm just fingers crossed she decides to wander into Juma. It's been quite interesting if we look at the leopard dynamics over the last while. There's been quite a lot of movement. So, specifically with Kula and Shadow having cubs, they've been quite a lot more sort of based in very certain areas. And, and we've seen female leopards like Tsakani move into what was could be traditionally classed as shadow and karula territory and even Salah Hesh with sam moving into what was very much shadows territory now could this be because they've got cubs and they're spending less time in, in those core zones that they used to also when it comes to Salah Hesh, which you saw with sam she's just had a an adult or well, she's got a, a very an adult cub now probably ju it's just over a year old now it's not uncommon for female cubs to become independent at that age so could Salah Hesh, being that beautiful big female that she is have given a part of her core territory to that cub to take over and she's now pushing further into shadows to challenge uh, leopards do that quite often they, they will leave uh, a core section of their territory to their female cubs, giving them a better chance at starting out in life. And um, that means we could start seeing a bit more of Salah Hesh. You spotted the leopard, there? Eh? Just, yeah, I can see this. There we go. So Dave thinks he spotted dead center frame. Dead center frame behind those leaves. I think you're seeing movement from the car behind. Sorry, Dave. To break your heart. There's a vehicle behind, and that's the movement. There we go. It's a person. Sorry. No problem. It's always worth double checking. So while we sit and wait patiently for Shadow to appear, let's go see what Sam's up to. So we've just been to the hyena den. Myself and VM just checked it out. The what, what looked like the what was the northern den that we went to, and we went to just go to see if there was any active hyenas. And to be honest, I've been there a few times now, and it hasn't been active. So I'm not quite sure what's going on with the hyenas at the moment. I think they could be moving dens. The only times I've seen them was like this morning when they were just running around in a frenzy. I'm not sure if any of you guys watched that. That was quite an interesting bit of behavior but we're driving back towards that open area where we saw the hyenas and it's getting to that time of day where they might start getting active one of them actually ran off into buffalo so i thought it would be a good idea just to come down into this area just to see if anything might not be moving around down by the watering hole as well as any hyenas that are lurking or coming back off from buffalo so let's see what's going on we definitely saw some of the cubs that were born. Okay, so we've just entered the open areas. I'm going to see if we can find a bush baby tonight as well. We've, we've had a few requests to see a bush baby and we, we saw one just as drive ended last night. So I really want to find one again today. So it's a little bit too early for the bush baby.
Aaron Hallis would like to know, is there any big difference in behavior between the brown and the, and the spotted hyena? Well, you know, the, the only hyena that we get in this area is the spotted, spotted hyena, and it's the only um, hyena that I've ever spent time and experienced. You do get the brown hyena in, in the Kruger National Park, but there is some significant differences to their social structure and the way in which they do things. Not many big differences, but there are some, and I'm not too sure of some of those big differences. So I've only spent time with the spotted, so that's a good question, Aaron. So go look up some of the differences between the spotted and the brown hyena. I really look forward to seeing differences in terms of the sexual dimorphism or just the the appearance, what they look like, the characteristics, they're very different. Of course, the spotted hyena is quite spotted. The brown hyena almost looks like it's got long brown hair coming on either side of it. So those are the main differences. Okay, so we're coming down to Sydney's watering hole now. And we were just at Buffalo watering hole. Let's see, there's something down there. Those could be guinea fowls, helmeted guinea fowls over there. Let's have a look. Stop. So the, yes, that's a group of helmeted guinea fowls. Is that by any chance a new bird for you, Aaron? The helmeted guinea fowl. I know that we get a lot of them, or we see them quite often out here, but is that by any chance a new bird for you? The helmeted guinea fowl. So let's see what else might be lurking around at Sydney's watering hole this evening. Doesn't seem to be much. Just those good old looking helmets of guinea fowls and I'll just get it out of my book and show you what that, those birds look like because they are quite far away from us. So this is the bird, the bird book that makes quite a, quite a few sounds. I can actually show you the sound of this. So we also get them where I live in Cape Town quite often. So here is what you're looking at, the helmeted guinea fowl. That's what it is. So Aaron, is this by any chance a new bird for you? Please let us know so that we can have a little bit of a party. And so we got to 50. If not, no worries, we'll keep on pushing on. And you're about to hear the sound of a fish eagle. So that is not the sound of the helmeted guinea fowl. That is the sound of the African fish eagle. It's a little device that plays the different sounds of the African savannah, the birds out here. So those birds are quite far away from us, so it's okay to play them over here. This is the sound. It's quite a strong, it's quite, it's quite a, a loud sound there. So that is the, the sound of the helmeted guinea fowl. I know it's quite annoying that, that my, my device plays two different bird calls before I can even play that one. But the second one that I played when I pointed it on there was the helmeted guinea fowl. And it really, really makes a loud noise. I'll never forget sleeping at home when I was a kid and just hearing the sound of that just coming outside my room. And it was just a natural alarm clock before I went out to school. That's in the hardy door, which makes quite a loud noise. But that looks like one empty. There's some birds over here that are flying. That could very well be the hardy dars that are flying towards us now. There they go. You can't quite see them because it's very, very dark. What are those? Can you see them from here? Let me get my binoculars out. This might be a new bird, who knows? Which ones? Spoonbills. No, can't really see. You can't quite see, but let's look in the distance here. Oh my word, I can't see them with these binoculars. It's too dark. Well, there goes a running in parlor, a ram down to the watering hole. I'm not sure what he's up to. But I can't quite see those birds properly. It's just too far. I think they could be spoonbills. Let's see on your one. On the... 
So that could be a spoon bill, but I can't quite tell. I th think the one that's standing up, so at the watering hole, there's a bird that's standing up to the right of it, just at the edge of the back there. That does look like a hardy dar from here. So is that a new bird for you, Aaron? It could very well be. So those are the birds that we've seen there. We can't quite see that bird from this distance in the darkness to tell and confirm that it is a hardy dar. I have got my... Pardon? Yeah, so VM agrees with me. VM also thinks it could be a hardy dar. But we should be able to hear the sound of that hardy dar, much like we heard the sound of the, of the Helmeter guinea fowl. <laughs> oh, man. Aaron just said that that was the first bird on his list. <laughs> That's quite funny, eh? Yeah, Aaron, did my best. I looked in the, into the distance to see if I could find something there for you. <laughs> the first bird you saw. <laughs> there I am trying to get it for you. Oh, well, all I can do is try. So let's just maybe see what else they could be. We're looking at from one perspective. Looks like just a good looking watering hole in the evening. I think there was a hippo in there. Let me just have another look. My binoculars. Points in just to the left of that dam, it's quite difficult to see, especially with this dark. Yeah, so you can't quite see it. It's a little bit too far away. I thought I saw a hippo just lurking around. There are a, a number of birds flying. There's that impala. There's the good old lonely impala. I might try and move a little bit. Apparently, we're having comms issues again. I don't know why. Can you hear me now? Okay, we seem to be having a bit of a problem with my mic here. Let's just try and move it ourselves a little bit. Maybe we might get a glimpse of a lying tree. just tantalizing me out of reach today. She's trying to see where she is. So Race is wondering, well, if there's no kill, why would Shadow be in the tree? Uh, quite often just because it's comfortable. That's a nice spot to lie. I saw a little half gap there. You see anything yet, Dave? Of course, she has chosen quite a thick area. Let's try it. There's another gap up here. Let's try this one. hasn't chosen the largest tree in the world. It's how frustrating is this? She's right there, just out of reach. Oh, this is, <laughs> it's like finding a needle in a haystack.
Sorry, Mfo? Ah, long here, Mfo. There we go. I think I see her now, Dave. If we go come out. Uh, where's the vehicle? Let's go forward a slight little bit. Okay. So go into that and up to the left. Just thought I saw a flicker of a, of a whisker. Not quite a whisker, but a, a tail at least. She's right in there somewhere. A little bit lower down. But, but up to the left and in there. See that very... There we go. She come down. I just saw a bit of movement of the trees there. I think she's in the tree just beyond. So where's my finger? So just behind that dark branch there. So the tree beyond that one we're seeing. A little bit to the left. And there. Is that a rosette or is it some funny leaves? Near impossible to tell from here. So I think we're going to... Oh, try from there, Dad. So... Ah. All right, guys, I've just heard that the, be the, the cub is there. So we're going to leave. Um, the cub's there. It's getting dark. So we're going to leave and we're going to try for her in the morning. Uh, I'm going for, I'm going to leave the area for my pimpans here. Yeah? Okay, so unfortunately we didn't get to see her, uh, but there is a cub there. It is getting dark, so we don't want to be around. And Andres, who's there now, is also about to leave. So they didn't know the cub was there. So the cubs just popped up. That's really good. Maybe she'll move it into Juma tomorrow and we can have a look. So I'm definitely coming to this corner first thing tomorrow morning. So for those of you who might be a little bit new, uh, when cubs are under a certain age, we don't view them uh, at night. Now, it's difficult to say whether this is a fact or not, but in certain areas, hyenas have learned to look for spotlights. So, you don't want to be banging around it. Also, uh, at night, the other predators are mobile. So, lions, hyenas, other leopards. So, you don't want to spend too much time around those cubs until they're a bit older. You want to give them the best chance possible uh, of reaching adulthood. They are old enough for us to view during the day now. So they are over two months old. They are able to climb trees. But this time of the day, twilight, the hyenas are starting to get moving, the lions are starting to get moving, and we don't want to af affect any possible chance that that, that that female leopard has of raising that cub. They already have a really torrid time of it, with 75% of their offspring dying. So, And Shadow, in particular, is not a very good mother. She has never successfully raised a cub to adulthood. The closest she came was with Sindile, uh, and unfortunately he then grabbed uh, a dog that tested positive for rabies and had to be removed from the reserve. He now lives in the lap of luxury at a, a, a recovery center, research center thing. But um, he will unfortunately never be able to go out into the wild again. Uh, he had to be kept in quarantine for a year. The male leopard, if we had to re uh, release him into the wild somewhere, he would probably just be killed by another male leopard. So that's why uh, he hasn't been released. But we're just going to leave that. She had two cubs. She's probably lost one cub, which is not unusual at all. It's getting a bit nippy. But we will definitely come and 
check up on that first thing tomorrow morning. Oh, that's, bit, that's quite a bit better, a bit warmer. So, but really, really exciting, and I cannot wait to get out there tomorrow morning. Um, I sort of like, you know, to be the, the first person to see cubs and find cubs. And so far, touch wood, uh, that uh, so far my, my cub finding luck or, or skill, depending on which way you want to look at it, is holding true. So I'm looking forward to being the first one to show you Shadow's little cub tomorrow. And fingers crossed. But till then, let's go see how Sam and his search for the smallest primate we get out here is going. I can believe that Brent loves to show cubs. Brent is a fantastic tracker and loves to see all the different cats of the bushveld and he's a remarkable tracker at that and I've been learning lots from him and from everyone else that's around here on how to track other animals a little bit more efficiently out here in the bush. So fantastic having mentors such as Brent out here in the bush as well as VM who's also very very good at tracking animals. So we are now out here and we are looking to see what we might be able to find. I would love to find an owl. I would really like to find an owl because that'll, that'll just top up that list to 50 hopefully for Aaron. And it would also just be great to see an owl we haven't seen for, for a while. But also I'd like to find us a bush baby this evening. So I think it's a little bit early at the moment for the bush babies. But one never knows. We might just see those eyes pop out and we have a bush baby. So let's pay attention and see what we might be able to find. Uh, so when looking for a bush baby, you're almost going to look for those, that glow, that bright red glow that comes out of the bush, and then you've got them. So they're actually quite easy to find. Well, relatively, I mean, you must just pay attention. They like to be at the top of trees sometimes. The trick is, you know, being the cameraman where these these bush babies jump from tree to tree in a matter of seconds. It's incredible how quickly they can jump. Actually, in a matter of seconds, in a second. <laughs> in the space of a whole second, they can jump from one tree to another and then to another. So they're very, very quick little, little guys, small as primates. And maybe, ooh, what bird is that? That looks like a nightjar. So we've got a nightjar flying here. Let's see, we see where it lands. Okay, so it landed just over there. Let's just go on this road going around the bushes here. Let's see if we can locate on this nightjar. Where did it go? Did you see where it went there, Viem? I know that it went down on the ground here. It must have just flown along the ground and away from us. So we did see it fly off. So that was a nightjar, but we can't tell you which nightjar it was. So we might be able to find another one. We'll definitely be able to hear them. Ooh, we're about to hit some bumps. Let's see, let's keep scanning these trees for any little bush babies that might be around us. It truly really is a fantastic sunset in the background there. I'm just trying to get off this road. It's really, really bumpy. Shouldn't be taking this road. Should stay on this road. So let's continue. Let's see what we can find. Mm. So we're looking for that red glow. Or that sound of a pill spotted owlet. hear that descending sound out in the bush this evening to see if we might be able to find a pill spotted owlet. Maybe it'll like to say happy birthday to me before the day ends. I think, I feel like I am in a bit of a party mood, so I'm going to put on my party hat. 
and I'm going to find us. This is very kindly given to me by Geraldine. So now I've got my party hat on, and I can find us an owl. If we are lucky enough to see one. Even a hyena running across these open areas. That's the only way we've been able to view these hyenas is that they come and find us. All of a sudden, you're just driving, and a hyena just pops out of nowhere. And you're just like, where did you just come from? Where are you going? And then it's gone. That happened with Brent on Arethusa this morning. Probably you could have been the very same hyenas that were running around with us, because the, those hyenas, when they were running, ran straight past us and into Arethusa. So it could, be, it could be the very, very same ones. I just saw a little bright, little, some bright eyes there. But they're too far away. Don't worry, VM, they're a little bit too far away. You wouldn't be able to see those. Some of these bush babies are hiding. And I got such great messages from my family and my brother on my birthday. So it was really, really cool to get all of that. And the last time, when I had my 24th birthday, I was in, I was at Londolozi and I was in the Sand River. And I'll never forget just having a, sitting on the Sand River on my 24th birthday. And then I left the bush a couple, maybe two months after that 24th birthday. And I never thought I'd be back here, you know. I thought that was it for the bush. And then, you know, I spent my 25th birthday in Cornwall. It was so beautiful underneath a magical, magic, magical sky of stars and a beautiful moon above us. Let's actually have a look at the moon. The moon's now quite bright out in the sky. James Richard is saying that the evening sky is looking, I think it is picture perfect. I think that's right. Listen to that, you can hear that. So you can hear the sound of those impalas rutting in the distance there. They've just stopped. So James Richard is saying that the evening is looking quite picular perfect. Much like James, is, uh, James Hendry's nice pictures that are picular, picular. So great, James has been teaching me that. Oh, oh, see, it's not easy to, to do two things at once, but I did just stall, so you can laugh at me with my birthday hat on. Okay, let's find something. You can hear the sound of some night jars in the distance there. We often find them in the, in the middle of roads. So if we look on the road, we might just see a night jar. But I would be just so excited, and I didn't even want to say it, just a, I would be so excited to see a caracal. I would be, I know, I know that it's one of those things that's it's so silly, it's, like it's so difficult to find caracal. I mean, much like serval, to see a serval is so, so hard, but I just thought on my birthday, to be able to see a caracal would just make me probably the happiest man, the most beautiful present from the bush that the bush could provide is to experience that, that caracal. As I've said a few times, that caracals really are the most magnificent looking creatures, much like the lynx. If you know the Eurasian lynx in Europe, or some, I think you have lynx in America, I'm not too sure. But they are such, such beautiful, beautiful um, creatures. And in, in the Bushman stories, he used to call them, oh, there's some buff, some, the sound of impalas running after each other over there. But in the Bushman culture, they used to see that the caracal was like the evening star. It had that same, some, same beauty to it. So they really, really admired the, the lynx or the caracal. So that would be the best gift this evening. So we're just coming across a bunch of impala that are rutting out in the open here. 
but you can't see them because it's nice and dark outside with the moon. Okay, so let's go and see how Brent is doing. Let's go and find some action. We're gonna go see maybe even if we can find a spider or something that might be lurking in the bushes that we can show you before the end of today's drive. We'll see you just now. So it seems Sam has given up on his bush baby search. He's going looking for spiders. So I think we'll take over the bush baby mantle. I think I know where they live, so we're gonna go have a quick look at a spot where I'm hoping to find some. But very exciting news. Shadow is back in the area and she's brought a remaining cub with her. And I cannot wait to try find them tomorrow morning. So our bird is wondering how Traverse works and are all the properties restricted to their own property? For example, if we were on the Kruger boundary and we happened to see a leopard on the other side, could we not drive there? If we drove there, we would probably be descended upon uh, by the Kruger anti-poaching uh, crew and that would not be a very pleasant experience. So the Kruger, the private reserves, we cannot drive across the Kruger boundary. Now, depending on what game uh, lodge you are or what property you are, there are different traverse agreements between the different properties. So, for example, uh, we can traverse Juma, which is sort of our home base, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains. Juma, if you're a guest at Juma, you can traverse Juma, of course, it's your home property, but as well as Cheetah Plains, Torchwood and Buffalo's Hook. Uh, Cheetah Plains can traverse Juma, Torchwood, Buffalo's Hook, Arethusa. So it all just depends on the individual landowners' agreements with each other. And of course, uh, it is always a very interesting thing when you have an eclectic mix of people negotiating such things. Uh, but Generally, everyone gets on quite well. That bush baby wasn't in his tree. I think we might be a couple of minutes too late. They might have already moved out of that hole. So, we'll loop up ahead. Maybe we'll catch them on the move. Lynn. Lynn's wondering how old is our shadows or cubs. I think it's only cub now. She's lost one as far as uh, the guys have told me. Uh, they're a month younger than Karulas. And Karulas were born on the 2nd of February. February, March, April, May. So Karulas are about four months. They must, that one must be about three months now. So very exciting age, a very fun age to spend with leopard cubs. And as far as I know, th those cubs are very relaxed. So very exciting, very excited for tomorrow's sunrise safari. See if we can find another cub. So Anne's wondering which cubs do I find the most adorable out of the big cats? So lion, leopard, and cheetah. Now, there is something exceptionally cute by, about a little lion cub. I think a little lion cub might be cuter than a little leopard cub. But for me, I really love little cheetah cubs. They, I think, are the cutest for me. But let's be honest, any big cat baby is just to die for.
So no bush babies through there. Maybe they went the other way. Could still be some on the edge here of quarantine. Also, always keeping a lookout for white-tailed mongoose, civet, any of those nocturnal creatures that might be out and about on a cold evening like this. It's amazing now. I've been here. Oh, quickly, Sam's got a bush baby. Okay, so we found a bush baby in this tree. Whether or not you can see it right now, probably not. But you'll see some movement. Yes, we've got two lights on here now. There is eyes in there. And if we are patient, and I've got my arms nice in a good position here, which is not very comfortable, but I really want to see this bush baby. Well, I've seen it. I want you to see the bush baby. I want you to see it moving around here. So let's just give it a few seconds. We've seen its eyes. So all we need to now see is the bush baby itself. I'm just going to lean a little bit more forward. Maybe let's reverse. Okay, so we can't see it right now. I don't know if you can. There, there. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we've had a little good search here. Brent has found a great creature, one of my favorite. Go and have a look. So we found the biggest, scariest, most dangerous predator of the night if you're a mouse. It is a verose eagle owl or a giant eagle owl. You can even make out the pink eyelids there, unfortunately facing away from us. And I was just mentioning to Dave, I think we're going to start seeing a few more owls as we head further into the dry season. Now this is the biggest owl we get. And the second biggest owl in southern Africa, only the pearl, I mean the pearl's fishing owl being bigger. There are a few bigger eagle owls that you get in the Congo Basin rainforests, but of the savannah species, the verose or giant eagle owl is king. Unfortunately, not looking at us, they have the most exquisite face. Oh, there we go, there it is. Isn't that magical? You can see those large eyes, white around them, to help catch any ambient light. And there we go, look at that face. And definitely one of my favorite bush sounds is the call of the giant eagle owl. It's a very low sort of and often hear it in the early morning in winter. It always reminds me of northern Botswana and actually following lions hunting on misty mornings in the Okavango Delta with the sort of resonating call of the Varose eagle owl in the background. I'm not going to play the call for you while the owl is here. It might upset him slightly, but when we move away a little bit, I shall play it for you. So a bird's free says, has Sam got wet yet for his birthday? No, he hasn't. The plan is to do it on the game drive catch up. So 
don't give it away, guys. Don't let Sam know what's coming. But the tradition of being a dunked in water will continue on the unwitting and unknowing Sam. But we're going to let this owl continue on his nocturnal hunt. And Dave and I are going to bid you adieu. And it's been wonderful having you. And we got to do a bit of a mixed match today, a bush walk and a drive. And I'm super excited to go look for Shadow and her cub first thing on tomorrow's sunrise safari. But now, for the last few moments of drive, let's go to the birthday boy, Sam. So, we managed to see... Ooh, there was something there. Hold on one second. That could be, once again, the star that I saw in the background. Oh, no, it's a Stienbock. Can't look at Stienbock at night time because it blinds them. Aaron made it to 50. I'm so glad, Aaron. Awesome. Very glad that you could have made it to 50. I've had such a fantastic day on my birthday. Everyone's made me feel very welcome. We had s awesome interactions as well of, between the, the buffaloes this afternoon, the buffaloes smashing against each other, the wonderful gym machine that was flying between tree to tree that was getting mobbed by all the different drongos, and especially those hyenas running around almost like wild dogs this morning. It was a fascinating morning of behavior. Even to see that, that female buffalo that was hanging out with those male buffaloes, very, very interesting behavior that we've seen today, so I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And once again, I do want to say, send a big thank you to all of you Safari fans. I've got your messages, I've received them, I've read as, them as many as I can. And I do send a big thank you, like it means a lot to me, it really does, to know that you guys have enjoyed me being out here in the bush. You've given me the confidence and I've grown and you know from the Wellingtons to Steph to James to Brent to Jamie, everyone, Viam, all the other ca cameramen have all been part of the great celebration of my birthday and I just want to send that big 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 thank you to you all. As you can see I've got my still got my blur, big blue birthday hat on. I don't think I'm gonna take it off until <laughs> someone actually rips it off my head. Jokes. So I'll, I'll probably take it out, take it off. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Gracie, aged eight, said that she will make me a birthday card. Gracie, aged eight, thank you so much for doing that for us. That, it, it means a lot to me, of course, to have your drawings. You know that I love to draw, so if you draw a drawing, I would be super, super grateful for that, of course. Gracie, thank you. and. Yes, thank you for singing. You said that you sang for me, that's so cool. Wherever you are, that's very, very sweet of you. I really, really appreciate it. And also to those ladies in FC, you know, thank you so much for this afternoon. It's been awesome um, for, from both of you, D1 and 2, Rebecca. I think it's Geraldine or Louise. Not too sure who D2 was, but thank you so much. It was both of them. Sweet, sweet ladies. I'll see you in camp. and. We are off back to camp now and I'm probably going to relax and we'll see you on the Safari Live which will be starting in probably about 10-15 minutes. Thank you VM again, honestly you're an amazing cameraman that can get those pictures and we shall see you tomorrow for the early morning safari. It's been great, we will see you later.